plant eaters or herbivores had as many as 2,000 teeth in their jaws at one time. Almost a full Tradunarifak here, Palio Yes, Palio Yes, Palio Yes, Palio Yes, Palio Yes.
Take. She'd bring an immediate return. Shoot the radar into the ground, and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program's incredible. Mm. A few more years' development, and we won't even have to dig anymore. Where's the fun in that? It's a little distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Oh. Postmortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. Five, six feet high, I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extraordinary... What did you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, got it in for me. <laughs> uh, look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. It's no one of these guys learn how to fly. That doesn't look very scary. <laughs> More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> a turkey. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, more just like, like a, a bird. More like a six-foot turkey. And... <laughs> turkey. Six foot turkey. Turkey. Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. <gasps> Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. You get your first look at this six foot turkey and see whether it clear it. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. It is wonderful to have you all here. Happy Monday to you. Hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Sorry I'm a little bit late. Had some technical difficulties to work through before the stream started, but uh, I'm glad you're here today. Today, everybody, is a very special stream. We're going to be starting our series of, uh, hopefully, pretty much weekly, guest paleontologist interviews. And today, we are going to have a rising star in the field of dinosaur paleontology. Keep an eye on this guy, Ethan Cowgill. Many of you already know and love him from our streams this past summer. Ethan's awesome, and we're going to have a good time. He's going to be joining us at 5 p.m. California time. So in about two and a half hours. Um, but yeah, very exciting. But shoot, where are my manners? John, John, it's oh! Marvin, your cousin, Barry. Andy Aspian? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the raid, Andy Aspian. How are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. It is good to have you here. And uh, Squid Pie Meow Face, hello to you. Did you come in with Andy? Thank you, Andy, for the raid. How was your stream? I hope it was really good. 
welcome to Paleontelligizing. That gives me the perfect opportunity to introduce myself real quick, especially if anybody here is new, like you, Squid Pie Meowface. And you, Cap uh, Capitan Guil? Guile? Guil? Let me know how to say your name, Capitan. But, uh, welcome to Paleontologizer. It's really good to have you here. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. So you probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. So while paleontology is the study of fossils, the study of the history of life on Earth, as revealed in the rock record, I specialize in dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are what I study, what I publish on in the scientific literature, and uh, usually what I dig up during the summer. Dinosaurs. So if you've got dinosaur questions, or questions about other topics in natural history, extinction, evolution, biodiversity, anything to do with the history of life on Earth, or broadly anything to do with science, really, I'll do my best to answer those questions for you. That's the beauty of a live broadcast like this, is, well, we can interact in real time. Anything that you happen to be curious about, we can talk about. Go on wild tangents. You know, the whole point of these broadcasts is to, to make science more accessible. You know? To, to kind of peel back the curtain and show you how science works, fossil science in particular, because that's what I do. So if that sounds good to you, I hope you stick around. And uh, like I said, today is an extra special stream, because we're being joined by another paleontologist, by the magic of Twitch guest star. Um, Ethan and I have done a ton of work together over the past two years, and I was lucky enough to join him this past summer in Wyoming, where this community actually funded the lion's share of our field work there. Um, it's incredible that this wonderful community, all you wonderful folks, were able to contribute financially and basically pay for us to be out there in the field, to be digging up at least two new species of dinosaur in Wyoming this summer, this past summer. We're gonna go out there and dig up more of them this next summer. Ethan's going to be talking to you about that, and uh, it's just going to be a fun, chill time, so I'm glad you're here. Anyway. Yeah, and uh, Bubsy says, is there any way we can cue our questions before the interview starts? Oh, amazing! 70 million year old dinosaur eggs, and they're perfect. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Nell? No! Thank you, Nell, for the 20 months of support. looking terrific. 19 months. That's long enough to gestate a rhino calf. There you go, Nell. Excellent. Excellent, excellent. When is National Rhino Day? Or International Rhino Day? I think it's in September. But yeah, we had a special stream about rhinos recently. We'll probably have another one soon. But rhinos are pretty cool. Perissodactyls. Anyway, Nell, thank you for the 20 months of support. You got me all distracted talking about rhinos. I got excited about rhinos. But I'm also very excited for your ongoing support now. Thank you for the 20 months. It means a lot to me. And it's because of that kind of ongoing support that... Here, let me show you, everybody. Uh... Yeah. Check this out. We were pushing for Partner Plus for the past... Three months? We got it. We got it. Holy cow. You're part of the Partner Plus program until at least February 1st, 2025. Which means that we got a new revenue split on this channel. This means that if you are subscribed to this channel, then you can rest assured that 70% of your subscription goes towards supporting science outreach here on Twitch, and in turn goes to supporting scientists. Not just me, but the guests that we bring on. Um, I think I told Ethan that he's getting an honorarium for today's appearance. Uh, we're gonna start it off at 50 bucks and see how that goes. 
that seems fair for about an hour's worth of of chit chatting about fossil science. But maybe we'll up that if our revenue continues to go up as well. Um, I want to be able to give something to my colleagues, and so many of us do media appearances. You know, we show up on news segments and in documentaries and stuff like that, and we never get paid for that kind of thing. It doesn't pay us anything, you know? And it's not like we're artists either, where we're getting paid in exposure. It's like that's not how it works. The most dangerous dinosaur around. Yogurt Garrel. <laughs> Yogurt Garrel, thank you, thank you for the 33 months. Holy cow, I appreciate that. How did your stream go the other day, Yogurt Garrel? I couldn't stick around for the whole thing. But I hope it was really good. And holy cow, Dinosaur Dave getting us started off strong for our sub goal for the week. Thank you, thank you, Dinosaur Dave. Look at this beautiful Tinamu bird, all excited about those ten gift subs. How generous. And, uh-oh. Uh little, a little, little too excited, maybe. Get out of there. It's gonna fall. Get the Dinosaur Dave is overloading the system with ten gift subs. Holy cow, Dinosaur Dave. One thousand bits can make thank a you, wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. And thank you. Very, very much, Reagan Nation, for those 5,000 bits. Holy cow. That is impressive. 5,000 bits, Reagan Nation? Holy moly. That, that pays for, for Ethan's... Sounds terrible. People die of that. Exposure. <laughs> oh, sorry. I... Let me just reiterate this joke before I go back to what I was saying. Risa Degu... I was talking about exposure. Risa Degu says, exposure? That sounds terrible. People die of that. And Salamander? The first one to, uh, to prompt our new alert here. Sloppy Salamander is washing away the ads for five lucky mammals. <laughs> Salamander, thank you, thank you. And Legion 5-4, thank you for the hundred bits there. Always appreciate the good stuff. Die. Thank you, thank you, Legion 5-4. I really appreciate that. Holy cow. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Um, but I do want to go back. Cheated. Try blaming the dinosaurs. And thank you, Wombat Hole. Like superb fairy wrens. They are superb indeed. And Cobraven. Yeah, everybody walk the dinosaur. Yes, indeed, Cobraven. That's what we'll be doing today. We'll be getting into some dinosaur discussion in a little bit. We'll also be doing some Metazoa, and we'll just be, you know, kind of having a grand old time until Ethan gets here in uh, two hours and 15 minutes, and then the party really starts. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. But again, um, holy cow, there. Dinosaur Dave, 10 subs. I really appreciate that, Dinosaur Dave. Holy cow. Uh, Reagan Nation, 5,000 bits. That that basically covers Ethan's honorarium right there. Thank you, Reagan Nation. Holy cow. That is excellent. It really is. Yeah. And Nell wants to know what museum is Ethan based in? So Ethan uh, is... Right now his official job title is, I think, Paleontology Intern at the Utah Geological Survey. But that really doesn't do him justice. I mean, if we're being honest... Um... Ethan is an expedition leader. He is uh, a researcher in dinosaur paleontology. Uh, he does science outreach and education. Um, he's, like I said, a rising star in dinosaur paleo. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Some of you are, are new. Some of you were not here this past summer when, uh, When we were streaming live from the field, from Wyoming and from Utah, um, the Utah, or the Wyoming field work, excuse me, that is Ethan's brainchild. 
So let's see. Let's do June 14th. Let's see, duckbill dinosaur. Now well, let's go to Utah. Here. Um, let's try this. Nice. Yeah. Here we go. A bunch of the new overburden that's coming. Overburden are the rocks and dirt and crud above the bone layer. So in order to be able to actually get down to the dinosaur bones, first we got to remove all the stuff that's above it, the overburden. So, so you know this guy already. That's um, this jabroni. But uh, it's got to get done. Yeah. Lego builds the gym. Not yet, Dinosaur Dave. I've got them. Right. I've got nice. them in a special place. I haven't seen Jim yet. Yeah. We have a hole anyway. <laughs> um, some of you might remember Don from last summer. Hey Ken, how are yeah, you doing? Don's the welcome, assistant welcome, Ken. state paleontologist for the state of Utah. A very and, uh, glamorous job, obviously. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> He's our fearless leader out here right now. And uh, yeah, there's Ethan over there too. Uh, yeah. There's Ethan. Ethan was our fearless leader in Wyoming, and now he's s somewhat fearful leader here. <laughs> Very scary. Yeah. <laughs> now Ethan works for the, uh, the Utah Geological Survey too. So uh, yeah. There's Fisher right there. Howdy, Fish. And we've got Justin. Justin's new this year, and uh, yeah, already proving his metal with the overburden. Yeah, we're glad to have Just him. opening up the quarry yeah. this year. This is the very we'll first the stream that I did from Utah. Um, anyway. Yeah, yeah. And it swims with whales. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. That gas station cowboy hat. You know, those are some of the only cowboy hats that are affordable, Ken, in my experience. <laughs> um, and aren't those the most authentic of cowboy hats? You know, that's a real working man's cowboy hat. Is one purchased from a gas station. None of these, you know, prissy $200 straw hats where you, you can't possibly get it dirty. No. Yeah, anyway. Um, but yeah, yeah. An interview day, yes indeed, Ash Rubber. Uh, fair, but more so that it was crushed, lol. Oh, there you go, Ken, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, every cowboy hat gets crushed, doesn't it? If it's actually doing cowboy stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. Man, my, my, that's why I really like my, my leather Australian slouch hat. That thing has been stepped on and crunched and run over by a Ford F-350. It's been plunged into a river and, you know, left out in the rain and all kinds of stuff. And it's still going. I've had that hat since I was 16 years old. Which is a long time. Considering that I'm now 21 years old. Holy cow. <laughs> I might be a little bit older than that, but I have had that hat since I was 16. Um, anyway, congrats on 21 again. Thank you, Valiant Cheese. I appreciate it. As always. Yeah. Anyway, uh, for those of you who are not aware, Ken, uh, Kate Trucker there in chat. Uh, is that, Ken, I don't think I've ever actually asked you about, about the origins of your username, if you're willing to share. Is that, is that Chuckar like, like the bird from India? Or is it some more esoteric or, uh, uh, obscure origin? You could be mysterious if you want to. That's perfectly appropriate. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, Andy Aspen. I appreciate that. TK, hello to you. Welcome, welcome. How many years is that now? I've had that hat for... Here, this hat. From, uh... I, I wear it when it's not quite as hot out. It was devilishly hot in Utah this summer. Which so I had the sun held it. But this so hat here... Like any dinosaur that you find here is going to be new, most likely. Yeah. Almond formation is what I'm talking about there. But uh, this hat I've had since I was 16, that was, oh goodness, it's like, like 16 years ago. Well, you didn't hear that from me. 
Yeah. Are you tempted to ever add corks to it for flies? Is that what why Australians put traditionally why they put corks on the brims of their their akubras? Is for flies? Really? I thought maybe it's in case it it falls into the billabong, it won't sink. I'd always assumed that that was the case. But is that the thing with uh? Is that? <laughs> There's the tourist version right there. <laughs> Nell says they also do it for tourists, clearly. Yes. Yeah, the corks are for shooing flies away. Really? Huh. And I guess it's just become... One of those things where the, the aesthetic has surpassed the original practical purpose. Interesting. Interesting. And holy cow, Sculpin, thank you for those hundred bits. I do appreciate that. Thank you, thank you, Sculpin. Good stuff. Yeah. Um... Australian Philosophers, Money Python. Um... Yeah... So that the corks like that? Oh, hello, Bruce. How are you, Bruce? Big crook, Bruce. Where's Bruce? That's what the corks are for, is to chew away flies? Not enough to boil a monkey's bum. <laughs> I did not know that. Wow. <laughs> it's just the world, the emblem of our land. There you go, Valiant Cheese. Yes, indeed. And thank you, Ken. Yeah, I saw that. It's a transitional name. My name is Kenneth Charles Rayburn, so K. Chuck R. Ooh. Ken. Holy cow, Ken. It is a transitional name. Ken, do you know the... And you've told me this before. And I, I'm sorry I forgot. Thank you for the reminder. I, I do appreciate that. Do you know the story of another transitional name? From the, uh, the whole... Kitzmiller versus Dover 2005 intelligent design trial. Do you know that story? Because <laughs> it kind of reminds me of that. But yeah. Arle says in Napa Valley, the corks on the hat are a status symbol. Yes, they show great wealth in uh... <laughs> having consumed multiple bottles of, of Merlot, Arle. That's... <laughs> Welcome back, Arle. It's good to see you. Hope you had a good weekend. And holy cow, Sculpin! Another 10 gift subs. And we've got a lovely Paleonath bird, a Tinamu. Not one of these newfangled Neonaths. A Paleonath. Sometimes they can be a little finicky, though, and... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's what's happening right now. Get out of there. It's gonna Take cover. Sculpin 01 is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Thank you. Thank you, Sculpin. Holy cow. Do I appreciate that. Look, we're already at 25, 25 subs. And it and it's just, you know, it's practically Monday morning. That's excellent. I uh, I really appreciate that, Sculper. Thank you for your support of this channel. And now 70% of each one of those subs, the revenue goes to this channel and to supporting science outreach here on Twitch. No longer 50%, 70%. So thank you, thank you for that. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah, Don your Pith helmet. That's not really an impact resistant helmet, Arlay. It's just a sun helmet. Um but yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sculpin. I appreciate it. Um Ken does not know that story. Oh, Ken, let me let me share something beautiful and wonderful with you. Um This is from a an award winning documentary from PBS Nova. Oh, hang on a second, though. Snowfall! Thank you for those gift subs. Holy cow! 5N0WF411 is getting serious with those five gift subs. I really appreciate that, Snowfall. Thank you, thank you. There's five people in the chat now. Won't have to worry about any ads at all for the next 30 days, thanks to your generosity. And again, 70% of that goes to this channel now. That's, uh, that's pretty, 
superb. Um, here, Ken, here's what I was talking about here. Let me find this clip. Uh, this is from the Kitzmiller vs. Dover trial. From 2005, when, uh, well here, I'll play the very beginning, and then I'll, then I'll show you this part. Just to provide some context, let's play the beginning. PBS Nova. Dover, Pennsylvania. Like much of the United States, Dover has become a town divided. I personally don't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution. Saying that you don't believe in evolution is almost saying for us that we don't believe the Civil War ever <laughs> took place in the United States. Dover is split between those who accept Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and those who reject it. And that rift between science and scripture nearly destroyed the community. It's not a rift between science and scripture, Science's that's the thing. First appeared. Is that there are the majority of of religious people around the globe, including the majority of like, you know, of Christians have no problem with evolution. They're not scared of it. They don't not threatened by that. 83 gifted a tier 1 sub to Panpuff. But anyway, uh Colony 83, thank you. Uh Kalini for the uh for the gifts up there. I appreciate that very much. Anyway, that's what this documentary is about. Dover High School student painted this a mural trial showing the evolution of humans from ape-like ancestors. And hey, not the brain. Welcome, welcome. Piece of artwork, very well done artistically, and it did not offend me in any way. But some in Dover were offended by the idea that humans and apes are related, and that mural was removed from the classroom and destroyed. Yeah. Flames uh. soon spread to the local school board. Angry that only Darwin's theory of evolution was being taught, the board required students... <laughs> it's not like they were upset that Lamarck's theory of evolution wasn't being taught. Or or uh, Edward Drinker Cope's idea of evolution. Or, or uh, Henry Fairfield Osborne's idea of evolution. No, they just don't like the idea of evolution. You know? And like a book burning? Exactly, Sculpin. Exactly. Let's hear about a controversial idea yeah. at odds with Darwin called intelligent design. Oh, boy. To just talk about Darwin to the exclusion of anything else perpetrates a fraud. But many say intelligent design is the fraud. Intelligent yeah. design is a science stopper. It makes people stupid. Yeah. 11 Dover <laughs> residents sued their school board uh, to keep intelligent design out of the classroom. And, and there you go, Sloppy Summit. Yeah. Dover was catapulted to the front. And Mommy Does remembers this. Newspapers. I'm just playing this clip as a prelude, as a little evolution. intro to this. Trials tear communities apart. They set neighbor against neighbor. Nobody wants to do this. You do it when you have to. With Dover split down the middle, a federal court would decide if intelligent design is legitimate science or religion in disguise. Yeah. Spoiler and alert. Would have consequences that reach far beyond the classrooms and of not even like it's about religion, politics, and power. Up next on Nova, Judgment Day. Intelligent design on trial. <laughs> okay. So now you've got the intro. Let's go back to this particular thing. Ken's explanation of his name reminded me of this right here yeah so the thing is intelligent design was basically like a rebranding of old-fashioned special creationism they just wanted to they had lost supreme like they'd lost court cases in the past and since creationism is inherently you know like a particular form of a religious doctrine it cannot be taught in public schools with taxpayer money. And so the intelligent design people thought they could get around that by basically renaming it intelligent design. And this is what happened here. Um, here we go. Yeah. Um, oh, and... Uh, here. I've never made a secret of the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic and a long tradition of scholarship. So this is Ken Miller, who is one of the key witnesses for the prosecution in the case. Um, and he is himself a biologist. Objects, gorgeous, and, and Red Zed. 
because though they died out so long ago, their fossil bones remain, so we know just what they were like and can even sculpt them into still, or rather, extinct life. Red Zed, thank you for the 17 months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Red Zed. It's good to have you here. And First Class Mulans, thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome to Paleontology. It's good to have you. Yeah. And Ken says, I own this tangent. Yeah, Ken. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ken? And Ken, this is Ken Miller right here. Yeah. Of the fact that I'm a Roman Catholic and a long tradition of scholarship in the Catholic Church has argued that oh, thank truth you, is one, that you. science and religion should ultimately be in harmony. But that doesn't make faith a scientific proposition. Right. I think, as many religious people do, that faith and reason are both gifts from God. And if God is real, then faith and reason should complement each other rather than being in conflict. I think Ken Miller's testimony in this trial was really, really powerful and helped show that intelligent design was a fraud. Um, so kudos to him. It's a paleontologist version of heaven. Dino GG's? Sounds like you're in the right place. Welcome to paleontologizing. It is good to have you here. Holy cow, Dino GG's. Welcome, welcome. Is that Dino in your name a reference to... The Fearfully Great Lizards? Dinosaurs? Because if it is, you're in the right place. If it isn't, you're probably, hopefully, still in the right place. You feel at home? Good to have you here. Okay, let's... Let's rub our Allosaurus snout here for good luck. Or something, I don't know. First time I've ever done that. I just want to show you this because I think it's cool. And I'm sitting in front of it the whole stream. Not many people get to see it. Unless I move out of the way. And Sculpin, holy cow, look at this. Got a lovely Tinamu bird here. Enthusiastically heralding the arrival of 10 gift subs. Thank you, thank you, Sculpin. I really appreciate that. Uh-oh. Get out of there, it's gonna fall! Oh, shoot! Sculpin01 is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Thank you, thank you, Sculpin. Holy moly. I really appreciate that. And duck and cover. Itsy Bitsy Bones, that's not a duck. That's a Tinamu. <laughs> Tinamus are these these lovely, lovely birds that really don't get nearly enough attention. Uh, they are really neat. They're sometimes called Chilean partridges, but they, uh... They are not anywhere closely related to partridges. They are their own... They're more closely related to, to emus and cassowaries and ostriches than they are to, uh... than they are to, to partridges, you know? Yeah. Anyway, Tinamus, really, really cool birds. Um, and they're paleonates, so they're part of this ancient lineage of birds. Um, they're often considered more, to use kind of a loaded word, more primitive than other birds. More, more basal. They are, they are early diverging. We'll maybe talk about that in a little bit, but I don't want to get too distracted from this. Um, here, let's continue with this tangent. Here. Yeah. ...reason should complement each other rather than being in conflict. And there you go, Mommy Does. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. Throughout the trial, Judge Jones would never tip his hand about which way he was <laughs> leaning on whether intelligent design <laughs> is science. But science was not the uh. only issue before the court. The climax of the trial would be the judge's ruling on a question stemming from a different line of evidence. Ah. When they introduced intelligent design into the classroom, were members of the Dover School Board motivated by religion? If so, that would amount to a violation of part of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the yep. Establishment Clause, which mandates the separation of church and state. 
But in order to prevail, we needed to prove either that the school board acted for the purpose of promoting religion or that its policy has the effect of promoting religion. It's, the, it's, it's either purpose or effect, either one. The Establishment Clause says that Congress cannot pass a law which promotes uh, one religion over another. And that trickles all the way down to any state action, and in this case, the actions of a uh, school board. Bag of Fish says, why are you drinking out of a measuring cup? It's a long story, Bag of Fish. But we have, uh, we have emotes celebrating that here. Can we get some Paleo Cup emotes going in the chat? But what evidence was uh, there that the school board was motivated by religion? <laughs> Ooh. Mission Once Impossible music. The trial, when Bertha Spar had unpacked the boxes containing the 60 copies of Pandas given by an anonymous donor, she found a clue. I was directed by the administration to unpack the boxes, count the books, stamp, and number them. <laughs> In the bottom of the box, I found a catalog. I opened the catalog to see what they had to say about the book in question. And at the very top of the catalog ah. page, it was listed under creation science. This, this is a classic detective be story here. Done and would be a benefit to us somewhere down the road. This Bertha Spar. That is a fighting name, Tip Cheerio. Yeah, Bertha Spar. That sounds like she could... That could be like a roller derby name. Yeah. Now, into the rink. Bertha Spar. Yeah, it... Yeah, you could see her just barreling across, knocking everybody else out of the way. I could see that. Yeah. And this is, this is such a cool story, isn't it, Sloppy Salamander? Yeah, it's really neat. Benefit to us somewhere down the road. Yeah. This information was handed off to the National Center for Science Education. Yeah, NCSE. The NCSE Maybe was helping the lawyers who were arguing to keep intelligent design out of Dover High School. Lawn Palmer, thank you, Scopin, yeah. Knowing of pandas and people <laughs> would be central to the case, Nick Motsky investigated the book. Yeah. When the court case was filed and pandas was adopted in the policy, it became clear that pandas was going to be the representative of intelligent design <laughs> uh, for the purposes of this case. So Bertha Spar, I believe, wait, was she one of the teachers? She might be like one of the big heroes of this story. Um, if she's one of the teachers from, uh, from the Dover, uh, from the Dover school, but I'm not, I'm not sure. And so the history of that book became important. The arguments it made became important. And we uh, undertook. Here we go. This, it's coming up. Aspects in preparation for the case. The good part's coming up. Motsky dug into pandas, examining it page by page. So this is the intelligent the design book. One of the one of the big, uh, imp, like, inciting incidents for this trial was the the creationist trying to introduce this book to a public school classroom when it's clearly like a religious book. Um, and trying to teach creationism, which is like religious pseudoscience, trying to teach that as science. This is the religious pseudoscience textbook right here. It's called Of Pandas and People. About its history. Yeah. Rummaging through... And diagnosis, I acquired a copy of Pandas. I have a PDF of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even less science than is portrayed by this documentary. <laughs> oh, boy, diagonal. That's really saying something. That's really saying something. That's wild. How did you, how did you acquire that? I'd I'd love to hear that story if you want to share it. Man, I don't have a, a physical copy myself. I feel like it's something I should have. Um, just because I'm really interested in this whole thing and I know some of the key players personally. Um But yeah, yeah. NCSE anyway. archives one day, Motsky came across a creationist student newspaper from nineteen eighty one. Ooh. At the bottom of the front page, he noticed a tiny article with a headline announcing unbiased biology textbook planned. <laughs> uh, and of course, in what world is a creationist textbook unbiased? In what land, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And that article.
article mentioned that a man named Charles Thaxton, now a fellow at the Discovery Institute, was working on a book that would present both evolution and creation. The academic editor was Charles Thaxton, who was the editor of the Pandas book. So it was clear that that ad was referring to the Pandas project. Um, what was interesting is that it talked about the book being about creation and evolution uh, instead of the later terms intelligent design and evolution. If they could show Pandas started out as a creationist book, that would suggest intelligent okay. design is simply... And octochiropens, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I know what you mean. ...creationism repackaged and therefore inherently religious. Yeah, Must but how could they prove that? ...information to Eric Rothschild, who immediately issued a subpoena to the publisher of Pandas for any drafts the book went through before printing. Oh, boy. In a few months, they received two boxes of material. The lawyers sent them to Barbara Forrest, a philosophy professor and author who has been tracking intelligent design for years. She was scheduled to testify in the trial. Oh, my goodness. Those two boxes contained about 7,000 pieces of paper. Holy and cow. I had to sit down with those documents. This is, this is like... I feel like every academic who is here in chat right now has had some kind of similar experience to this. Um, you know, where, like, you've got some sort of problem. There's something that you have to prove. There's something in your thesis that you have to demonstrate. And you know it's in here somewhere, and you just have to be able to find it. Oh, boy. And just start flipping through them, which is what I did. Day and night. After much digging, she hit pay dirt. Buried in these documents Forensic were two drafts yeah, of diagonal. pandas straddling the 1987 case of Edwards versus Aguilard. Oh boy, this is it! This is it, Ken! Ken, I... I hope you're still watching right now. Because this is... Oh, this is what we were trying to get to. Um... Yeah, yeah. Uh... It's in just a minute here. But we've got a lovely case of of maybe anagenesis you know um you're here all right all right which take it Supreme check it out court ruled it unconstitutional to teach creationism in public school science class yep one draft was written before the case and the other revised just after ah. in the first 1987 draft which is the pre-edwards draft uh the definition of creation reads this way Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator <laughs> with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fish fins, with fins and, scales, and scales, birds, birds with, with feathers, feathers beaks, beaks and wings, wings. etc. <laughs> the same definition in this draft, after the Edwards decision, reads this way. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began abruptly. In oh. oh boy, oh, I wasn't fast enough. What havoc will they wreak? What lives will they destroy? What depths of panic and terror will they create? Octavius King, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you all? It is wonderful to have you here. Holy cow. Uh, welcome to Paleontologizing. Shoot, we'll get back to what we were just talking about in a minute, but let me greet these raiders real quick. Welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. We're going to be interviewing a colleague of mine, friend and colleague Ethan Cowgill, a fellow paleontologist, in uh, a little under two hours. But for right now, we're uh, yeah, we're just kind of chilling, talking about fossil science, that kind of thing. I'll play a welcome video for you in a few minutes if you'd like. Deepest blue dragon. Cool. I appreciate your 20 months of support there. Holy cow, deepest blue dragon. Thank you, thank you for keeping me online for that long. And, uh... Nostalgia Nerd says dinosaurs. Yes, indeed. That is what I do here. Um, and, uh, Dakana Garretson. Seems like you're new here, too. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Jade Clad Wanderers says prepare for mayhem. We'll let the mayhem ensue in a few minutes. We're gonna we're gonna briefly finish what I was talking about here, but welcome everybody. My name is Danny Anduza. 
I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I'm here on Twitch trying to do some, uh, some good old-fashioned science outreach, you know? Talking about fossils, talking about my own work in the field of paleontology, answering your questions, trying to to bring fossil science home for you, to to peel back the curtain and, and show you what it's really like. Something about how the world was 80 million years ago, which is Becky Pogs. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. Holy cow. Um. Yeah. Thank you for the follow, Deconic Erickson. It's good to have you here. Here, let's let's get to the punchline for this. Oh man, how do I explain this to the people who've just arrived? They were finding fossils. In T days, thank you for the follow too. By the way, Octavius King, how is your how is your stream? I hope it was really good. Um, I uh, I hope you and the rats all had a wonderful time. By the way, holy cow, you should check out. If you're interested in the fossil history of rodents, then, uh... Here, I think this might already be... Yep, it's already up, thanks to the lovely Claire Burr, but we did a, uh... We did a special stream for Groundhog Day on Friday. And, uh... We talked all about rodents on Friday. Yeah, here we are. Scientific Why in the world would a paleontologist be talking about Groundhog Day today? It is admittedly a pretty silly holiday that we have here in the United States, but... And Canada. It does actually have a thing or two to do with various scientific concepts that we're going to be discussing today. Not least of all, rodents. Wonderful excuse to talk about rodents. The most biodiverse group of mammals currently exist today, at least in terms of speciosity. There are so many different species of mammals. Rodentia is the most speciose group within mammalia. We'll yeah. also talk a little bit about seasons. Talk a little bit about climate. Go bear weather, bold, you're right about that. All that good yeah. stuff. So yeah, yeah, we talked all about rodents on Friday stream, and that was a ton of fun. Um, where was our? Uh... Yeah, here we talked a little bit about Groundhog Day. Talked about rats and I... capybaras and pacaranas. This is kind of a bizarre American tradition. And I'm really pleased to be able to offer it to some of you who are not from these United States or from Canada, where we have Groundhog Day, with both countries. We didn't this talk much about Degus, no, Dakana, you know no, no. It is, it is, it's so weird, but it's also fun. And so I'm so pleased to present this to you, you know? Uh, Germany kind of yeah, but it's a badger there, Badger Crusader. And, there, and I don't know if we can talk about do people Crusaders. still celebrate yeah. Candlemas Day in in Germany? That's still a thing. Any Germans in the chat? This is a dumb tradition. I mean, yeah. It's a tradition. Before we get Phil out, we get him fired up by chanting Phil, Phil, Phil. Yeah, Phil, this religious Phil, cult here, Phil, the cult of the Phil, groundhog. Phil, Phil. Look at all those people. And of pandas and people is on its way? No, Wait, what do you there. mean, Chael's Bub? Live broadcast, you know? Did you send that not to me just... via Amazon? Is that what you're saying? Those of us broadcasting on Twitch got to deal with audio. Or, or to the P.O. Box? Is that what you're saying, Chael's Bub? Yeah. Uh, eBay. And rescue guy. <laughs> yeah, there are Holy cow. pretenders to the throne. Other marmots across the U.S. who also have, you know, uh cults of followers like this, and they make prognostications about the weather. Punxsutawney Phil is the most famous of these, however. It's Punxsutawney Phil! <laughs> Behold, rodent! Bow before it, commoners! <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah. You woke me up for this, <laughs> Sculpin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we've got a very docile marmot here. So, groundhogs are actually, uh... Like, what, what creature is a groundhog? Let me show you. Go to our tree of life here. Not seeing much of a sign of an early spring here in SoCal. Yeah, nor do we know. Holy cow. It is rainy, rainy down there right now, isn't it? Here, it was raining here earlier. It's been really windy and then sunny and then rainy and then windy and then rainy again. But, um, let's see what it's like here. Yeah, here's the view from the Berkeley Hills, from the Lawrence Hall of Science. This is right near where I live right now. We've got some rain, we've got some clouds, we've got some sun, we've got some fog. That's what it looks like here now. But I hear you're really taking the brunt of that atmospheric river down there, down south, there do we know, aren't you? Seven inches in 24 hours. Holy cow, there do we know. Give me a minute, and after we maybe play a welcome video for some of the new folks, maybe we'll talk about the Ark Storm. Nerduino, are you familiar? Are you familiar with uh, with what the the U.S. Geological Survey has termed the Ark Storm? Because I just found out about this the other day. Atmospheric River A R, and then the K stands for one thousand, so it's like an atmospheric river storm, one thousand year storm. Sounds cool, though? Oh, we will talk about that in a bit. We will talk about that in a bit. Um, but yeah, shoot. First, let me finish this tangent here. Then we'll play a welcome video, and then we'll get to that. So uh, those of you who came in with uh, with Octavius King, I really appreciate you. And can we get another, can we get another uh, shout-out for Octavius King real quick? I'd appreciate that. Um... But yeah. yeah, through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact. Fish. Uh, so for those of you who are new here, who had just joined us, this is from a doc. Oh, man. How do I? This is we're like several tangents deep here. But in 2005, there was a big court case about like creationism in United States public school classrooms. And uh, creationists had reverted to this tactic of of trying to rebrand creationism as intelligent design um, in order to uh, to get it taught in public schools. And then there was a big court case about it. And then, uh, yeah. Anyway, through some, uh, through some forensic sleuthing, looking through some archives, uh, some scientists and science advocates were able to demonstrate that yes, intelligent design is just rebranded creationism, and this is one of their smoking guns. Ruled it here. unconstitutional to teach creationism in public school science class. Yeah, 1987. One draft that was the uh, Edwards versus Aguilard case, I believe. Was written before the case, and the other revised just after. In the first 1987 draft, which is the pre-Edwards draft, uh, the definition of creation reads this way. Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent Octo, yeah. creator with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. Yeah. The same definition in this draft, after the Edwards decision, reads this way. Intelligent design means that various forms of life began <laughs> abruptly through an intelligent agency with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins, fish with and, fins scales, and scales, birds with birds feathers, with feathers beaks, beaks, and wings, etc. Same yeah. definition, just one is worded in terms of creationism, the other one worded in terms of intelligent design. But that wasn't it. Oh boy, but that's not all. There was... Something even more dramatic here. Take a look. Someone said intelligent design is creationism relabeled. Never in our wildest dreams, though, did we think that this would actually be recorded in paper in a way that could be documented in a court case. Yeah. And that became probably our best single piece of evidence at trial. Barbara Forrest's testimony would make a strong case that the Dover School Board was thrusting religion into the classroom. 
and in comparing oh, the here we go. and people drafts, Forrest discovered that the authors had apparently made their revisions in haste. Oh, 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 oh. It's not in the script. They failed to replace every word properly. I found the word creationists. Um, and instead of replacing... Oh, Ken, I hope you're still here right now, Ken, because you prompted this discussion in this... Oh, this is, this is the punchline right here. Um, check it out. Um, and instead of replacing the entire word, they just kind of did this. <laughs> and, uh, design proponents with the C in front and the ISTS in the back from the original word. So the uh, correct term for this transitional form is co-design proponentsists. And uh, everyone now refers to this as the missing link between creationism and intelligent design. You've got... <laughs> Oh, it's oh, nom, 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 nom. oh, it's just delicious. Oh my goodness! And bag of fish. Of course, this is real. You'll never go broke. You know, overestimating the incompetence and ignorance of of creationists. You know, the direct physical evidence there of a transitional uh, fossil. Barbara Forrest's testimony not only traced the creationist lineage of pandas. Citing a Christian magazine's interview, Forrest let one of the intelligent design movement's own leaders, Paul Nelson, speak for himself. Yeah. The question he was asked was, is intelligent design just a critique of evolutionary theory or does it offer something more? Does it... <laughs> Jerry and Rick says, much like flat earthers, you would be surprised i think by how much that venn diagram overlaps there between creationists and and people who who claim to believe that the earth is flat it's 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 shockingly close to a circle it offers you know? something that humankind needs to know and this is his answer quote easily the biggest challenge facing the id community is to develop a full-fledged theory of biological design we don't have such a theory right now, and that's a real problem. Without a theory, <laughs> it's very hard to know where to direct your research you focus. Bold, yeah. Right now, we've got a bag of powerful intuitions and a handful of notions, such as irreducible complexity, but as yet, no general theory of biological design, end quote. The evidence she brought into that courtroom really exposed the hypocrisy of the intelligent design movement in a way that's irrefutable. Uh, you know, she used their own language, things that they had written and said, to show that they themselves knew that this isn't science. And on the stand, Michael Behe was asked how he would define science. Hmm. So he's like a, a, he was one of the key witnesses for the defense in the trial. He's like a, an intelligent design creationist. Um, he's well, like one of the leaders of the intelligent design movement. Dr. Behe, using your definition, intelligent design is a scientific theory, correct? Yes. Under the same definition, astrology is a scientific theory, using your definition, correct? Using my definition... A scientific theory is a proposed explanation which focuses or, or points to observable physical data and logical inferences. There oh, that logical inferences line is doing so much work there. There are many things throughout the history of science which we now think to be incorrect which would fit that definition. Yes, astrology is in fact one. So is the ether theory of the propagation of light and many other, uh, many other theories as well. The ether theory of light has been discarded. That is correct. But you are clear. Under your definition, the definition that sweeps in intelligent design, astrology is also a scientific theory. Yes, that's correct. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Oh, man. And you loosen the rules around what is science and... Uh, permit the supernatural, permit deities, 
um, you are really destroying what makes science so vitally important to the progress that our civilization has witnessed over the last four or five hundred years. You're going back before the scientific revolution. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, before we go further into this tangent, let me give you a link to this wonderful documentary here. Um, which features a prominent paleontologist, Kevin Pabian. Is, uh... Appears in this documentary here. Um... Just as Darwin proposed. Yeah. The reporters in the courtroom who were just amazed that we knew all this stuff. And how come they hadn't learned about this stuff before? And the reason is, it's not in textbooks because the creationists fight so hard to keep it out. That's been a big influence. But yep. Yeah, and I, I talk about this all the time. This is a major reason why I'm here on Twitch. Streaming five days a week is because... As paleontologists, we have learned so much about how the natural world works. So much about, about where we came from. And where every other species on Earth came from. This is hard-won knowledge, you know? Not just through genetic data and comparative anatomy, but also through study of the fossil record, the work of paleontologists. This is something that... It didn't just fall into our laps. There were blood, sweat, and tears that went into each one of these discoveries. And it's remarkable. For, for thousands of years, people have asked the question, where did we come from? And now, we actually understand that on a factual, empirical basis. We actually know that. As paleontologists, and as biologists, and as scientists. And so much of that information has not yet made its way to the public. And that's because, like Kevin Padian says right here... You know, creationists work so hard to keep that out of the textbooks. And it's... So sometimes we have to find other ways of educating the public, and that's what I'm trying to do here. You know? So yeah. Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. Anyway, um, thank you, thank you there, uh, Retro Inter Ossiter for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It is good to have you here. Here, let's play a, a welcome video here for all of the new folks, including you, Retro Inter Ossiter, and all the good folks who came in here with Octavius King. Here. Get another shout out for Octavius King. If you're interested in cute little mammals, rats, and rodents, what we would call, uh, I, I believe glyries is the a scientific clade that encompasses both rodents and lagomorphs, including rabbits. Yeah. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. Glyries, you'll find both of them on Octavius King's stream. So go give a follow to Octavius King if you like these animals and you want to see them cause mayhem on stream. Um, good stuff. And Hogan698, thank you for that gift sub to Retro. I appreciate that. Now, without further ado, we're going to bring forth a good friend of ours, somebody we call previously recorded Danny. And all of the new folks, including Retro Interocitor, and all the folks who followed after Octi's raid, I'm going to introduce you to this channel in the best way I know how. Through... Hey, hang on! Goodness. <laughs> Sorry, he's, he's very excited. Previously recorded Danny. 
I was going to talk to you for a minute about uh, about what this channel is all about, who I am, what my background is. I don't really like talking, talking about myself that much. He's much better at it, so that's his job. We'll let him do his job right here. Previously recorded, Danny. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks, present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to Paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm going to level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, Kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy, Alan Grant, was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspects of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchunchus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives and help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home where the hadrosaurs roamed, where triceratops bellowed and grazed, where erosion uncovers bones we seek to discover for to strike the whole world amazing. Oh, I'm on a range, range where the deer and the, the antelope play, where 
I sailed on his hood, I discovered a word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. Genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Octavius King for that wonderful raid earlier. Sorry, we were already embroiled in some tangents before we got to that. But thank you, thank you, Octavius King, for the rating. Can we get another shout-out for Octavius King real quick? I'd really appreciate that. Um, go follow Octavius King if you're not yet doing so. If you love rodents, especially rats, and all their lagomorphs, too, like rabbits, go follow Octavius King. Um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, we had a wonderful question here from Taco Nako here. How are you doing, Taco Nako? Taco Nako says, hey, I'm a high schooler who is looking to go into paleontology. And I was wondering how to get started and if college is the way to go. If so, which college would you recommend? Taco Nako, I'm so glad you asked that. We're actually going to be talking about this with Ethan when he shows up for our interview later on in a little bit. But, uh... Yeah, yeah. First of all, let me start by saying that there are about as many different ways to be a paleontologist as there are different paleontologists. I know paleontologists who have a background in physics, or computer science, or engineering, or geology or zookeeping, or plumbing, or trucking, or all kinds of other things. There are lots and lots and lots of different ways to become a paleontologist. And increasingly, it seems like, like, uh, I don't know. There are, there are edge cases, myself may be among them, where college isn't necessarily the way to do it. But the primary way to become a paleontologist is to go through the university system and study as much biology and geology as you can. Because paleontology is basically an amalgam of, of biology and geology. Those things combined, you know, the different skills that you learn in both of those, the different ways of thinking, the different knowledge sets that you gain combined kind of form paleontology like that. But as a high schooler, uh, Taco, the, the best piece of advice that I can give you is if you happen to live anywhere near a museum, see if you can get into there as a volunteer. This is how I got my start as a paleontologist way back in the day, many years ago. Here is me as a high school student at the University of California Museum of Paleontology in Berkeley. 
This is, I was probably 15, 16 at the time. Working at this museum. The thing is, you can go to a university and you can take all of the right classes. And you can get all the best grades and everything, but afterward, it's not like you're guaranteed a job or anything like that. And it's not like you'll necessarily have any field experience or research experience or anything real like that. That piece of paper, that degree, can certainly be worth something. Especially if if you're the sort of person where you're kind of wired to, to do well in classes in a classroom environment and be good at that kind of thing. But that's not all of us. That's not necessarily me either. The best thing that you can do in my opinion, is to just put yourself where the action is. If you have a museum that is near where you live, or if you can engineer it so that you live near a museum, go put yourself where the action is. Work in that museum. You will get to know paleontologists, you can get involved with research, with laboratory work, with fossil prep, with with field work even. That is the best way that I know of to, to become a paleontologist, to actually work in fossil science. And that's the best piece of advice that I can give you. Get yourself into a museum. And if you know, I was really lucky in high school where it, like, I had a roof over my head, and, like, you know, there'd be a hot meal on the table every night for dinner when I'd come home. You know, I didn't live next door to a museum or anything, but I could take a bus and then take a train and then walk and then get to a museum. The University of California Museum of Paleontology. Um. Yeah. UCMP. Right here, uh, just down the road from me in Berkeley, California. But yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, a piece of paper, a degree, it counts for something, but it doesn't necessarily show that you've actually had experience in research or in field work or in thinking like, like a paleontologist. So this is the best piece of advice that I can give you. Get yourself into a museum, immerse yourself. You know, it's almost kind of like learning a language, where, like, the best way to learn a language is to just kind of, like, dive into the culture and just be there. You know? It's the same with paleontology, if that makes sense. So, Taco, I hope that's useful advice for you, and I wish you the very best of luck in, uh, in your, your paleontological adventures. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, here, let me, let me catch up to chat right here. Uh, Bag of Fish says, I'm trying to volunteer at the California Academy of Sciences. That is in my neck of the woods, Bag of Fish, right here in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area. The Cal Academy is a wonderful place. It's really awesome. Yeah. They don't have a lot of fossils there, though. Um, so if, like, you're interested in paleontology specifically, well, shoot, if you live in the city, then it's excellent. Yeah. But there's also UCMP and Berkeley, and there might be a few other... Well, shoot, in the next... Over the next decade, there might be another fossil museum popping up here in the Bay Area. I can't say too much about that yet, but... Yeah. Yeah! Yeah. Um, but yeah. You're an SF2. Very cool, Bag of Fish. Yeah. I, I live in the East Bay. Um, but awesome to have you here, Bag of Fish. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Lauren, but he seems sincere. That's the thing, is that like. Tradune. I don't know. Don't get me started on flat eartherism and and creationism and dinosaur denialism and stuff like that, but it is...
It's an impetus for people like me to continue doing what we're doing. To do it more. You know? There are, I think there are reasons, like, we as scientists are, I think, a little bit culpable for a lot of this suspicion of science in the general public. I think we, we hold a little bit of responsibility for this idea that, that science is a, is seen as like some elitist ivory tower kind of activity, you know? We need to do, uh, we need to do a better job as scientists of reaching out to the public and showing people how science actually works. And That's, that's part of what I'm trying to do here. You know? Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. And... Oh, boy. Good dog. Yeah. This is the thing, good dog, is that... What in some of the things that you were saying, there are kind of like dog whistles and and canards there from climate denialists, and I'm kind of thinking that that's probably where you're coming from here. And I am hesitant to turn this stream into a lesson about climate change. But this is the thing: is that When we let our personal biases get in the way of the actual data, that's when things often go haywire. I've seen this in many different areas. In creationism, in like Bigfoot evangelists, in like, you know, UFO believers, or, you know, like JFK conspiracy theorists who think that Obama killed JFK or and flat earthers and all kinds of stuff like that and like that's it's a big part of the reason why I'm streaming here today you know there is tremendous gain to be made emotionally by people when they, when they think that they have some kind of arcane knowledge that the rest of the world doesn't have. That's one of the appeal of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories or pseudoscience or other arcane knowledge like that. That like, oh, I know this. In the scientific community, they're all wrong. The general public they're all they're all stupid sheep or whatever. Only, only people like me really know the truth. And there's a reason why ideas like that are not well accepted by the scientific community at large, and it's because they don't actually have evidence. It's religious, or excuse me, emotional or sometimes religious region, reasons why those ideas feel so delicious to certain people. You know? So yeah. Good Dog says, I'm an engineer. That's a red flag. I gotta say, that's net, that's a red flag, Good Dog. For you to use the word engineer like that, as if it's a... You're using it as a, like, pillar of authority. Oh, look at me. I'm an engineer. And I believe this. Look at my credentials. There are plenty of people who believe really out there things that are factually untrue, who have impressive credentials. What actually matters in science, and, uh, and I do mean this as a generalization, this is generally true. And you can take this to the bank. What actually matters in the sciences 
is whether the work that you produce is well respected by your colleagues and whether they use it and whether it is used to further their own work and thus further the scientific discipline you know as new discoveries are made there are lots of crackpot ideas out there from climate denialism to flat earth to you know the the moon is actually hollow colony filled with leprechauns that control world events or whatever you know What actually matters is, is your work useful? And is it used by other people in your field? That's where the rubber meets the road. That's how scientific consensus moves forward. That's... the real thing right there. That's what we're all striving for in science. So yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, uh, uh, with that being said, we're going to change gears here and we are, oh shoot, we got to get into Metazoo here before it, it refreshes for the day. Shoot. Okay. We got four minutes left. Let's get into this one. Oh boy. Okay. We almost missed Sunday's Metazoo. On Monday, we do two Metazoo entries. One for Sunday, and one for Monday. We almost missed Sundays right here. This is an animal guessing game where you try and guess the animal of the day. And, uh... I tried to warn you. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. Sorry. So, uh... Yeah, yeah. Give me the name of a placental mammal here, chat. I did giraffe the other day, Cast the Dreamer. Let's get a different one. Cast the Dreamer, that's a good one. We did giraffe the other day. Sculpin says beaver. So the way that this game works is you've got to try and guess the mystery animal of the day. Much like in the game Wordle, you take a guess and then you narrow it down. But here we're using phylogeny, the evolutionary tree of life. Let's try beaver here. And holy cow! We've gotten extremely lucky here. Holy moly. Oh boy. Oh boy. We're in rodents. <laughs> Atreus Minis, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Here, let me uh let me show you what we're talking about here. Let's go to rodents here on our tree of life. I try and use these Metazoo games as like a uh as uh, an opportunity for teaching, you know? Hmm. So, rodents. We've still got 2,096 species, give or take. But, you know, in one guess, boiling it down from 1.4 million species of animals, there's just 2,000. That's, that's pretty excellent. So, we guessed uh, beaver, and we got rodentia. So the way this game works is it shows you the most exclusive clade. A clade is a, a group of living things that includes the most the, the common ancestor and all of its descendants. So it's like a true biological group. We've got Rodentia right here. Beaver and our mystery animal. So, rodents. Let's jump to beaver right here in rodents. We can try and be really smart about using our guesses here. The American beaver and the Eurasian beaver are both in genus Castor. Right there. Uh, Castoromorpha. So we know that our mystery animal is not part of Castoromorpha. It's a different kind of rodent. And that tells us also it's not a pocket gopher or one of their relatives. But it could be a degu, a porcupine, a chinchilla, or more. Mole rats, tuco tucos. Or potentially it could be one of these mouse like rodents as well. 
but let's try. You know, let's try. Let's try porcupine. Because, you know, that would be a really lovely one. This game doesn't have... Like, if I search Daegu here, it doesn't have Daegu. You know? But let's try... Let's try Porcupine. And see if... Oh, no! The game resets? It's 4 p.m. and the game is reset. Oh, crimity. I didn't know the game resets in the middle of a game. On Greenwich Mean Time. Oh, boy. That That's really crummy. That means we've just broken our streak. We had like a 15-day streak or something like that. Uh, we warned you... I didn't think it would do that. I didn't think it was that poorly designed, you know? Shoot, that's really crummy. Beats International says, Love that Danny is thoroughly talking us through this thought process while everyone screams time. I didn't think it would be like that, you know? Well, with it being web-based, it's purely based on time. I didn't think it would be that dumb, but I guess it is. I guess let's start again. And it already recorded our previous guest. So it's a bilaterian animal, not a porcupine. It was hamster? Okay. Well, let's... Let's go up to Bilateria. I guess we got 24 hours now to figure this out. I can just wait till tomorrow to do it. Hey, sweetie pie. How are you doing? You want to come over here? Hey. Want a treat, sweetie pie? Hey. Ooh. You know what that noise is. Come here, Speedy Pie. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Sweetie Pie. Hi, Sweetie. How are you doing? <laughs> One of my landlords here. Sweetie Pie, how are you doing? Yeah, hello. Come here. Sweetie Pie. Ooh, look at that treat right there. Good stuff. Oh! And she does not want to be on camera right now. Yeah. What'd I do? Uh oh. I pressed the mute button on the keyboard. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Lordy says, Sweetie has quickly decided that Danny is her favorite in the house. Sweetie Pie, am I your favorite? Favorite Sweetie Pie? Want another one? pretty good, right? Hey. Do you want another one? Ooh. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know where to find it if you want it. Oh, and there she is. It's Sweetie Pie. Good stuff. She's been real camera shy lately. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, but she is a carnivorous, indeed, Alexander Morrison. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and oh, I'm getting text messages. Shoot, what is this? Ethan wants to know how long I'm going to have him on. Yeah. And I guess let's go back to Metazoo here. We've now got 23 hours Damn, to figure this son, out. Where'd you find this? What? What soundboard button was that? Damn, son, where'd you find this? I guess it's the asterisk key. Okay, cool. Um, that's good to know. I put that one on there a long time ago, and uh, and I forgot about it. But uh, let's get back to uh, to Metazoo here. Uh, I can't believe I broke my streak. That's lousy. I didn't know it would reset like that in the middle of a game. But, uh, yeah, so we know that's a bilaterian animal. So, let's go to bilateria, bilaterally symmetrical animals. Our way out here. Yeah. Oh, you just texting me? Sounds good. Cool. Yeah. So, and we're not at amphibians, reptiles, and birds. We're even more distant than that. This is not going to be a vertebrate animal. So since we've got bilaterally symmetrical animals, since we guessed porcupine here after it reset, uh, if it were a mammal, it would say mammals. If it were a an amniote, it would say amniota. If it were a vertebrate, it would say vertebrata. Right now it's saying bilateral, which means it's a bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical animal. And sweetie pie, welcome back. Well, well, well. You've come back for more. What are you doing, sweetie pie? What are you doing? Yeah. It's good to see you. You're just doing some exploring. You want some exploring, sweetie pie? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Good to see you, sweetie pie. Good to see you. Yeah. Look at you. Oh. What are you thinking? Do you have a guess what our animal of the day is? It's bilaterally symmetrical animals. What do you think, sweetie pie? No, it's not Felis catus, or it would be a mammal. Yeah. What do you think? You look at my decorations for the day? All these Cretaceous dinosaurs and my geological map of Wyoming? Look up there. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. What are you doing, sweetie pie? She's really doing some investigating over there. Yeah. What do you think, sweetie pie? This part of the house is not very well sealed, so she can smell like outside the house by going over here. I think that's what she's doing.
Octopus? We can, Phoenix. I believe octopus are mollusks. Within gastropoda, they are bilaterally symmetrical. So we can try that. And Maribold says apparently hyenas are related to cats, not dogs. They're related to both, but they're much closer to cats. Like Sweetie Pie did. I think it's Sweetie. Do you know you're close to a hyena? Hyena is closer to you than it is to a dog. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, but they are deuterostomes. That is true, diagonal, yeah. Oh, good point. Good point. Um So yeah, so despite Jerry Rick, despite uh Echinoderms having five-way symmetry, they are still considered deuterostomes, I believe. Which is kind of confusing. So, uh, here, let me show you. Yeah, Echinodermata, the Echinoderms, are still part of Deuterostoma. Yeah. Starfish and more. Uh, Ambulocrania. They are part of Deuterostomes. Yeah. And they're bilaterally symmetrical as embryo embryos, that's why. That makes a lot of sense, Octo, yeah. Yeah. So we know it's not a deuterostome. It's not a vertebrate. It is basically gonna be part of this group. Or or a protostome. It's probably gonna be a protostome. Let's search one of these. We can either I don't know. Sometimes it helps to use these. So, like, we do see elegans. We could do other model organisms like Drosophila melanogaster, or we could do a ladybird beetle. Let's try ladybug. I don't know. That's always a favorite. People love ladybugs. Let's try that. Neoptera. Ooh. And that was a good guess. Yeah. Excellent. So it's within Neoptera. It's not only within insects, it's within Neoptera. Ladybug and our mystery one right here. Let's jump to Neoptera on our Tree of Life. The modern wing-folding insects. Neoptera right there. So it's not a ladybug, but it is within this group. And that tells us it's not going to be within this group, probably. Or than this group, or that group. It might be more primitive than that. It might be something like a... What are some of the more primitive of insect groups? Maybe like a cockroach, or a mayfly, or something like that. A stonefly, perhaps? Gladiator, let's try... Or it could be a stick bug. Well, we had stick bug what, last week, didn't we? Let's try... I don't have stone bug. Let's try... Let's try mayfly. And nope. That didn't do it either. Oh, wait, shoot! Stoneflies, mayflies are outside of Neoptera? Gosh darn it. That's not what this clade. So this is really interesting. Our phylogeny here directly disagrees with the one in the game. The one within, uh... Mayfly. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. It doesn't say that. My mistake. My mistake. Mayflies don't fold their wings. Thank you, Jody Fish. If I'd known more about insects, I would know that. Let's stick to within Neoptera here. And let's... Let's think about a... Let's, let's maybe look at it like a mantis. Here. Ouch! Sweetie Pie, did you just hit your head against the door? That sounded like it hurt. We're having some cat drama here. There's a cat outside of the cat door and a cat inside the cat door, and... Oh, boy. 
boy. Mini Pie, don't be a bully. <laughs> Cat drama chat. Um, let's try Mantis. And see where they pop up. So they are... Okay. Okay, Mantises are related to Phasmids, like stick insects, like we were talking about last week. Uh, let's, let's try a Mantis here. Just for kicks and giggles. Praying Mantis. Let's try that. Holy cow! <laughs> Holy moly! Yeah! We got really lucky there. We got really lucky there. And that kind of makes up maybe for our... Uh, we had a 15 streak... 15... Okay, max... Uh, ah! Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> but we got it in four guesses, which is not the worst, you know? That's not the worst. But that's just, oh boy. Yeah. I didn't think it would be stick insect or stick bug, because that's what it was a few days ago. I knew mantises were related to them, so I said, let's try mantis, and that ended up being it. The European mantis, mantis religiosa. Wait, really? Mantis religiosa? The praying mantis? Well, well, well. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, flat Earth. I don't. I don't know if this bug believes in much of anything. I think its its daily thoughts are probably on what prey to catch next, and that kind of thing. By the way, did you know, chat? There is a film about praying mantises. I'm not going to say it's a good film, but it does include a paleontologist as one of the main characters. It is called The Deadly Mantis. <laughs> oh boy. From the the 1950s craze for giant monster films. The Deadly Mantis. Uh. Where are they? Where are the bodies? Easy. In all the kingdom of the... This is the paleontologist character in that film. You might actually... Long, long time viewers of paleontologizing might recognize him from some of our alerts. And Bat Mothers is great MST3K episode. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. In all the kingdom of the living, there is no more deadly or voracious creature than the praying mantis. <laughs> oh boy. You think you'll be able to drive it out to sea? I hope so. Every device of military science, every defensive weapon, radar, oh, planes, boy. rockets, marshaled to destroy a thousand tons of beastly fury. A monster leaving a trail of carnage, spreading panic across is a this continent. Public domain? I don't. It's not Andy Aspia, no. no. But the trailer is. Yes, the trailer shouldn't get me DMCA there. Good for its time. It Nothing wasn't the its worst. Was safe. Not the planes in the sky. The flying monster would have been about 15 and one half meters. Speaking of flying monsters, Shara Danicus, thank you for the 15 months of support. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for keeping me online for the past 15 months. Appreciate that. Not the ships at sea. Not the vehicles. Not the vehicles on the ground. 
<laughs> you boys might just as well go back. There aren't any bodies. And then this most dangerous monster that ever lived challenged the security of our cities. Oh boy, the climactic scene at the end. Now I can see that my uh, 50,000 a year has been well spent. Janine's Mass, thank you for the six months of support at tier three there. Holy cow, Janine's Mass. I really appreciate that. I really, really do. Thank you. Thank you. The Deadly Mantis. And, uh, I wonder if we can find the MST3 clay, MST3K clip with the part with the paleontologist in it. Let's see here. For those of you who aren't following MST3K here on Twitch, you are perhaps missing out. Because uh, they also stream here on Twitch. There's like, isn't it? Isn't one of the twenty four seven channels here? Good stuff. Nerdo oh, 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 Thank you for the hundred bits. I appreciate that very much, Nerdo And you didn't know they had a Twitch? Absolutely, Arg. Yeah, yeah. That's how a lot of younger people know about MST3K is through Twitch. Which, you know, for for olds, you know, like me. You know? Yeah. You don't need to salute yeah. the paleontologist. Get back here, you chicken! Wait, 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 what? <laughs> yeah, this is the part right here with the paleontologist. Yeah, so this is one of those 1950s monster movies where the paleontologist is actually one of the main characters. Uh, good stuff. I've been in such a hurry to slice them up for <laughs> oh, Satan. No. Huh? Suppose they were still alive when found in the ice. Jerk. Does your learned young friend always go on like that? All right, Professor. Okay. You know as well as I do that a living man go. is frozen quickly enough. It Get is up. theoretically Get possible Punch to him. stop the living Kick total. Oh, the 1950s. Oh, oh, boy. Boy. Happens when death occurs. <laughs> Beat him, man. Yeah. Is it unreasonable and to ask yourself ropes. whether the mammoths mightn't have remained alive all those years? And it was the Siberians who killed them before they had a chance to thaw out and breathe again. Damn, Siberians wreck you, everything. Yep. You believe this? Well, I don't Shh. disbelieve it. And I'll go along with it till someone comes up with a better theory. Leave me alone. Five men have vanished. My heart. To die is one thing. Oh, to God. disappear without a trace suggests complete destruction. A flesh-eating creature. But there are scores of insects that live on other insects. Where do you start? By thinking of the hook as though it were infinitely smaller. Oh. As though it were part of an insect no larger than those... Oh, have. boy. So the, the whole reason I bring this up is because I think it's, A, funny. The, like, this depiction of paleontology in the 1950s in a, in a science fiction film like this. Also, there's some good sound bites and stuff. But also, we were talking about mantises because that was our metazoa creature for the deck. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in just a few brief moments here, we should be bringing on a real rising star in the world of dinosaur paleontology, Ethan Cowgill. We're just waiting for him to show up here in the chat, and then uh, we can bring him on for an interview. So, yeah, yeah. Please ask Ethan if he is calling from the Pentagon. Something tells me he's not. I don't think the Pentagon is in Salt Lake City. Dinosaur Dave. <laughs> don't give him context, just ask. I'm not I'm not gonna freak out a friend of mine. <laughs> Asking him a non sequitur like that. But uh, there you are, Ethan. How howdy howdy, Ethan. It is good to have you here. Let me go ahead and campaign they have uh, given 269 gift subs in the channel and thank you thank you lenina i really appreciate that good stuff so let me bring you on here ethan let's see um get to sub invite open a stream together in a browser to invite a guest why is that not working hang on a second i might need to open it up in stream manager here but 
Anyway, Ethan, it's good to see you. We had a good day of fossil work there. And invite. There we go. All right, excellent. Just waiting for you to connect there and. Excellent. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and NBs and everybody else, paleontologizing supporters and chatters, lurkers and viewers, you're in for a special treat right now. To kick off our series of paleontologizing guest paleontologist interviews, we have our good friend Ethan Cowgill. You already know him. Some of you already know him from our live streams this past summer. Uh, in Wyoming and Utah. And it looks like he's just scurried home from... Either from class or from his job at the Utah Geological Survey. And, uh... Let's see, where should I see the link to join? No worries. Um, look in your chat window. There should be an invitation there. As he's getting ready there. Excellent. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. So this is the fruit of all our, our hard work here, especially you, chat, and getting us to the uh, the Partner Plus status here on Twitch. I can afford to actually pay guest interviewees like Mr. Ethan Calgill. Uh, Ethan, can you, uh, can you hear me right now? All right, cool. Here, let me... Let me try and bring you on here. Let's go to our... Oh boy, that's different. Hang on a second. This is going to take a minute, Ethan. Oh, goodness. This has changed. This has changed. Here, let's go to here. And... Let's see... Here, give me a second here. Um, let's copy this, and let's go to our guest star scene. There we go. Yeah. And let's embiggen this right here. And then, uh, and push guest. Looks like that's working. Excellent. All right, Ethan, can you say something? We'll see if uh, we'll see if you're coming up in the audience. Tradoon. Monopoly. <laughs> Tradoon. Do you say Monopoly? Uh, yeah. It's, it's let me let me like make that a little bit louder for you. What's that? Guest star audio. Let's see. Let's turn that up significantly. Say something again. Say Torvosaurus or something. Something again, Torvosaurus. All right. That seems like it's working. Um, but let's turn it up even higher here. Is there any way you could put the mic closer to your mouth or anything like that? Yeah. I think um, let me just... Yeah. Switch to. Is this better? That's a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Say, say, I don't know, Anki Ceratops. Danny. Yeah. That sounds better. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, buddy? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Yeah. Good. All right. Can you hear me now, Danny? It's a little, it's a little quieter now. 
Would you? <laughs> it's a live broadcast, everybody. This is how it goes. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's still a little quiet. Still a little quiet. Yeah, it requires a little bit of tinkering here. You know, this is the way it goes. And the soundboard is super loud now. Let me see if I can turn that down. Hopefully everybody can still hear Ethan at this point. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear, Ethan. Can you hear me? All right. Perfect audio, says Lenina. Excellent. Good stuff. Yeah. I appreciate everybody's patience while we work this out. Especially you, Sweetie Pie. How are you doing? You want to come back over here? Can I so you can hear me that? now. I can't hear Danny. I can hear you, Ethan, perfectly well. I don't know if you can hear me right now. Hmm. I'm going to type to Ethan. Can you see the chat? Ethan. Yeah. Let me switch off this microphone. This okay. one. Sorry, we've got a cat blocking our, our screen right here. <laughs> uh, what are you doing over here, sweetie pie? Yeah. I'm talking to the cat. I'm not talking to you, Ethan. <laughs> yeah, you can hear Danny now? Excellent, Ethan. Good, good, good. Yeah. Requires a little bit of troubleshooting. Maybe in the future I'll, I'll come up with uh, some music or something like that to play over this part as we bring on paleontologists to the stream. Danny, can you hear me? I can hear you, Ethan. Yes. Um, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> it's a comedy of errors, chat. This is just how it goes. Yeah. So... They can hear you, and they can no longer hear me? Is that what I'm gathering? I think so. I think they can't hear you right now. Chat, can you hear Ethan right now? Let me know in the chat. Oh, they hear me. Oh, good. They good, good, good. Them. Okay. Let me see if there's something that I can do to raise your audio levels, Ethan. Because it seems... It almost seems like the, the, the laptop or computer that you're using is using its microphone, rather than the one that was... I guess you took your headphones out, huh? The, yeah, did the headphones sound better? Maybe. I have you turned up as far as you can go right now uh, okay. on my um, side. So the headphones might be... What? That might be ideal here. Okay. And sorry for the cat in the way. I, I promise, I'm not a cat. You're oh, on I can't, I'm not uh, a cat. I don't see any cat. <clears throat> Let me try to connect. The thing is, if I connect the he these headphones, you may not hear me. So let's just try it again. Okay, let's and try. We'll see. I can also just turn up your volume, Ethan, if so I can hear you. If chat can hear you, okay. Chat, let me know. Type in if you can hear Ethan clearly right now, because if you can, then we're all good. There might be a disconnect between what I can hear and what you can hear. Can you hear me clearly? Is that better or worse, chat? Let us know. Uh, 
<laughs> Clearly, but quietly. Well, now I can't hear a thing. For some reason, so. You can't hear a thing? Shoot. You might need yeah. to... Maybe, uh... Hmm. All right, Danny, if you want to give me 30 seconds, I can go and look for another microphone real quick. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, go for it. Go that for work? It. We got plenty of time. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> nice. I'll be right back. Oh, wait, hang on. Hang on. Ethan, hang on. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, your voice is a lot deeper than I think your voice is deep. Yeah, shoot. I think. I think What's the opposite of helium? Fine, the thing and, people and... breathe in the my voice might sound crazy right now, and apologies if that's the case. But uh, Ethan is loud now. Everybody's saying you're doing well. All good now. Your mic is fine, Ethan. I think we're good to go. If cool. If if this is workable for you, I think we can continue. Yeah. Cool. Um, Sounds like a what, plan. What is it that you're drinking there, if you don't mind my asking? This intrusion on your privacy. Is that... Uh... <laughs> Pina colada, orange or what have you got? Classic orange juice. Cheers. All right. <clears throat> it's yeah. orange juice cut with water and orange. Yeah. Nice, nice. I will not disclose what's here in my mug. So, um, yeah, you'll just have to, you'll just have to guess. You guys. better not. Yeah. But anyway, for anybody who's just waltzing in, this is Ethan Cowgill of the Utah Geological Survey. Ethan was... Our fearless leader last summer in the field in Wyoming, in late Cretaceous Almond Formation, and we're going to be doing some field work again together, it looks like, this next summer. And so, Ethan, thank you for being here. This is actually our inaugural paleontologist interview stream for the year. I don't know if I told you, Ethan, but I, I recently got a raise on Twitch, like a 40% raise. So I can afford to pay paleontologists, oh. like colleagues, every week to come here for interviews on Twitch, and you are the very first of ours right now. So why don't we just get squared, or go, squared away right here at the beginning? You've still got the same Venmo, right, Ethan? I do, although it, uh, thank you, thank you very much. It's an honor, it's a pleasure. Congrats on the raise, that's terrific. And uh, I appreciate your help here. My Venmo is, uh, let me is open it. Ethan Dino? I don't remember the name. It's like, Dino, Dino hyphen 24. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's type in paleontologizing honorarium. Let's be real formal about it. There you go. Um, it was, yeah. So we, we were recently able to to reach a new uh, revenue split level here on Twitch, which was really awesome. And so I can actually afford to, like, pay other researchers to appear for interviews here. So you're the very first one of those, Ethan. So thank you for, for being kind of our guinea pig here. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so first Thanks off, for having me. I appreciate it. I'm happy to be here. No worries. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, thanks for, for being so chill as we work out some of the kinks at the very beginning. Um, hopefully this will be the most scuffed of all of our interview Indeed. streams um so thank you ethan for your patience and thank you chat for your patience as well um but uh yeah ethan do you want to tell us maybe a little bit about yourself and what you do introduce yourself to chat real quick for those of you who are not familiar with you sure so i work at the utah geological survey where I collect dinosaur fossils in the summertime and do surveys for dinosaur fossils. And then in the wintertime and in the fall, um, I prepare or clean up or conserve dinosaur fossils that we collect to get them ready to go to museums and live in museum collections and get studied and that kind of thing. Um, I'm also I'm an undergraduate student studying geology, and I uh, do research on mostly Jurassic and Cretaceous dinosaurs. Nice. Is that another cat that's nuzzling up against you right now? It's an epidemic, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, this is <laughs> it's spreading here. Yeah. Oh, we remember him, right? Yeah, this is Java. 
Oh, Java. <laughs> Long time viewers of this stream remember Java from our... Remember, Ethan, our stream when we were making sandwiches before the, the Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference? Java was quite the... Uh, he was not camera show. Yeah, we could have yeah. yeah, done it without her. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm glad to see she's doing well. Yeah. I moved into a place that there are three cats yeah. roving around here like uh, like lurking sharks. And apparently, uh, uh, occasionally they show up on stream. Oh, man. Um, kind of whenever they feel like it. You know how cats Watch are. Watch your toes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, those of you who are here in the chat, if you've got questions for Ethan, feel free to type those into the chat. I've got a few pre-recorded questions, but we're kind of winging it here. So uh, yeah, do not be shy about typing questions into the chat. Um, but Ethan, already in this stream, I got some questions from some potentially aspiring paleontologists about how to become a paleontologist. And so I'm kind of wondering about, well, I already know a little bit about your background, but could you elucidate for the chat how you got to the position that you're in right now? How did you first get interested in paleontology and how did you kind of spin that into a career in fossil science? Sure, yeah. Um, real quick, do you happen to know the age of the person that asked that question? Uh, high school age, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so what you're going to want to do specifically for this person is uh, get as good a grade as you can in high school, and then you're going to go to college and study either geology or biology or both. And then you're going to try to find uh, a paleontologist that maybe lives near you or maybe that studies something that you're interested in, and you're going to email them or uh, go to the nearest museum and try to volunteer for them. And then once you start meeting people who are doing paleo, then a bunch of doors will open for you if you're um, excited and interested. Um, with you, if you don't meet uh, the right people, nothing will happen, unfortunately. So, but <laughs> generally, people are people in paleo. It, you know, it kind of depends on volunteers. So having a, um, doing some free labor can really move mountains for your your career. And then if you want to be a museum curator or a professor that studies paleo or uh, works at a museum or that kind of thing, you'd go on to graduate school after your bachelor's degree, where you'd get maybe a master's degree or maybe a PhD doing research on fossils. And uh, yeah, by that point, you'll have probably a, a clearer idea of exactly what you want to do paleo-wise. Um, but for me, I was really, uh, really, I had terrible grades in school. I have like extremely ADD. Um, so school was always a frustrating uh, avenue for me, I but I did that. a lot of volunteering at museums and yeah, big time. Yeah. <laughs> Paleo kind of attracts that kind of person oftentimes, um, <laughs> True. but I did a lot of volunteering. Like I got to meet some paleontologists that uh, uh, were really, really helpful and um, were very generous with giving me opportunities even before I deserved them, you know? So it kind of like, um, snowballed and it sort of motivated me to work really hard because it's like i now ha i have to earn these nice opportunities that have been offered to me so generously so you kind of step up to the plate and then um yeah volunteered yeah. with all kinds of museums across the southwest um went to scientific conferences that kind of stuff yeah and ethan i think i remember back in 2014 uh at the mid mesozoic meeting i you know drove down from montana to be there and you were there as like a were you like a first year undergrad or a high school student or but we actually met there and i didn't even realize i would have been 14 <laughs> yeah yeah so the 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 best advice that that i feel i can give people is to just get involved with paleontology from an early age if you can so like i was lucky enough to be involved with ucmp here in berkeley when i was in high school but you had early opportunities. Um, you were you were like talking with paleontologists when you were like fourteen years old. You were already going to conferences and stuff like that, um, and which is really really cool. How much of uh, 
of an influence do you think living in Utah had for you? Because you grew up in Utah, correct? And that is... A, oh, oh, and hang on a second, Ethan. We are getting a huge raid right now, which is a good thing. I know it sounds like a bad thing. Nice. But um, this is... Uh, somebody <laughs> just ended their stream. And... Uh, no, no, hang on. No, sorry. This is a This is a spam thing. Sorry. This is not a good advertisement for Twitch right now. Um, this has not happened to me once in like the past three years, but we're getting a big like a bunch of spam bots coming in the chat. So sorry about that, Ethan. Anyway, what I wanted to get into here was uh, was the wonders of Utah. You grew up in Utah, and Utah really might be the best place in the world for dinosaur paleontology. Um, how much of an influence do you think that had on your, your own career and your upbringing uh, and the opportunities that you had and maybe just kind of sell us on the idea of Utah dinosaur paleontology as a native Utah and yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I think it had an enormous impact on, uh, my development in paleo because, there might be more museums, more dinosaurs, and more paleontologists in Utah than maybe any other state in America. Um, yeah. So I was extremely fortunate in in that way, um, where I could just sort of, you know, drive thirty minutes from my house and meet with a paleontologist, uh, volunteer with a museum, that kind of thing. Um, and Utah has such a diverse number of institutions that are involved with paleo because. Utah has, like you mentioned, an incredible paleontological uh, legacy and uh, just really immense amounts of fossils that are known from the state. Yeah. And that's because Utah has uh, the perfect geology to produce dinosaur fossils. So, right, dinosaurs come pretty much exclusively from land. So if you're going to find a dinosaur, it's got to be uh, in rocks that were deposited on or near land. And the rocks have to be in the Triassic, Jurassic, or Cretaceous periods, because that's when dinosaurs lived. And those rocks have to be exposed at the surface, because if they're covered in plants, you're not going to be able to find any fossils. So yep. Utah has a ton of rocks of, of exactly the right age, the right environment, and it's a pretty arid place. It's very dry, so there's not a bunch of plants covering most of these the dinosaur outcrop. So it's just vast expanses of country um, that are really ripe for the picking. For finding dinosaurs in and whereas some places like mongolia has an incredibly abundant dinosaurs they're all over the place um some of the most fossiliferous or dinosaur rich badlands on the planet are in mongolia but there you have kind of a different situation where you have a few different slices of time that are, are, are exposed very broadly yep so you can go and collect a hundred skeletons of the Tyrannosaur Tarbosaurus. And so you get to see, you know, what complete skeletons look like, but you don't have a very continuous record through time like we have in Utah. So whereas in Utah, it might be a little harder to go out and find a complete dinosaur tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, what you do get is an extremely complete record through time. So almost the entire age of dinosaurs is represented in Utah. And we have more species of dinosaur in Utah than in any other state in America. Um, and there's probably dozens that are currently in museum collections or being excavated or named as we speak. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Holy cow. Good, good explanation there. Um, and a huge number of those have actually been excavated and described a disproportionate number of those have been excavated and described by, by the organization that you're part of Ethan by the Utah Geological Survey by people like Don DeBlue and Jim Kirkland um how did you can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the Utah Geological Survey uh, as a means to like inspire those who are watching right now who are dreaming of a career in paleontology how did you do that sure yeah I just <clears throat> I had seen the Utah state paleontologist, Dr. Jim Kirkland in a lot of documentaries and stuff as a kid. <laughs> Me so he's too. in things like yeah. the, uh, the documentary that shall not be named Jurassic fight club, or he's in a great documentary <laughs> called, um, when dinosaurs roamed America. Oh yeah. Um, he's got a lot. He, so he was like one of the, he was one of the big wigs 
when I was a kid, right? You'd turn on the on Discovery Channel or Animal Planet and see he was one of maybe five faces that you see over and over again in dinosaur stuff. Mm-hmm. And he uh, lived 30 minutes from where I lived, and he happened to be giving a, a talk uh, that I found in a newspaper clipping. And so my dad drove me to see that talk, and then uh, Jim and I, after the after he finished speaking, talked for like an hour straight. And he got me to uh, join this club called the Utah Friends of Paleontology in Salt Lake, oh, yeah. where they you meet fought. and they have uh, monthly meetings. People get together and give talks. And so started doing that, and then I started volunteering with Jim in the field, and I got all kinds of really terrific opportunities, and I gained a lot of great skills from him and from his uh, assistant, Don DeBlue. So I got some really great experience in how to collect fossils, how to find fossils, how to prepare and clean fossils in the laboratory, and learned a lot about the science and uh, about how a career in paleontology looks like and how it works from them. So Mm -hmm. it's all all thanks to, to Jim. So it really comes down to kind of proximity in a way, right? If you can get into a position where you're interacting with paleontologists, where you're you're there where the action is, that really makes a huge difference in your experience too, right? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's that's Absolutely. cool because but, but all is not lost if you don't live. Go ahead. No, go you go for it. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say, all is not lost if you don't live, uh, you know, a stone's throw away from dinosaur badlands, because there's fossils all over the entire planet. They just may not be dinosaurs. And usually you'll find uh, there's often a paleontologist, wherever you are in the world, in any moderately developed place, there should be a paleontologist studying fossils that are from that area. So if you... You know, if you're working uh, in British Columbia, if you live in British Columbia, there's a good chance that somebody's uh, there studying fossils in British Columbia, like re- like really old Cambrian, like ancestors of vertebrates and like really old arthropods and really cool stuff like that. So it might not always be dinosaurs, um, but there's plenty of other interesting things all over the world. So, yeah, that's that's good advice because again, not everybody lives near. Shoot. Growing up here in the San Francisco Bay Area, I don't live anywhere near any dinosaur exposures, but I'm lucky there was a museum that was a train ride away from me. But yeah, in the age of the internet, you can you can talk to paleontologists, you can you can read scientific papers. In some small way, the internet does kind of bring things together for us, and that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, yeah. Here, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Oh, no, no. (laughs) Okay. I heard that sharp inhalation. I thought maybe you had something to say. But, uh, yeah, I'm I'm wondering, (laughs) just to to kind of, uh, uh, like, bring things down a little bit for the chat. Ethan, did you have any favorite dinosaurs when you were a kid? And, like, I know I had a rotating cast of favorite dinosaurs when I was a kid, that kind of led up to the present. Do you have any there? And it, it might be a little bit embarrassing to share. Some of mine are a little bit embarrassing, like Dryosaurus, for instance. But uh, do you have any that, that you would like to share with the chat? Yeah, I have. A, I have. It's a very rare dinosaur that no one's ever heard of. Um, called Danny, you've probably heard of it. It's called Tyrannosaurus rex. <laughs> <laughs> that was my favorite dinosaur as a kid by far. Yeah. Um, Classic. Yeah. And, Obscure, but, but, you know, um, but good. What's fun <laughs> is that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, not much is known about them, unfortunately. Um, but what happens as you get into doing research on fossils is that once you start sinking your teeth into like a scientific problem, um, about any particular group of dinosaurs, suddenly they become the most interesting thing in the world. Oh yeah, and especially with field work, you know, the kind of things that you're finding in the field often become the most interesting thing to you, because that's an opportunity to contribute um, to the science in some way and develop new knowledge. So, for example, I'm extremely interested in duckbill dinosaurs in hadrosaurs right now, uh, even though they're not, they may, they might not be the most charismatic dinosaur you could think of. But we're finding lots of them, and 
we know so much about them. So we get to ask really interesting and specific questions about how dinosaurs were evolving through time using hadrosaurs as a kind of a model organism. So, yeah, yeah, really cool. And I really like ceratopsians as well. They're really cool. We'll be talking about both of those taxa, I think, in a little bit as we talk about what we were digging up last summer in the almond formation of Wyoming. But, uh, yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, and, and I really like what you said there, too, about, like, how, you know, when you're a kid, you know, the your encounters with dinosaurs are through popular culture, through books, through movies, through documentaries and stuff like that. But once you actually start getting involved in the science... You're interacting with these things in the laboratory and in the field. You're actually finding fossils. And it's really kind of amazing how, like, your imagination just gets captured by these things that you're, you know, that you're actually finding there in the real world. Um, and that's that's such a magical feeling. Not to be corny or anything for the chat, but, like, it's it's kind of extraordinary when... When you can actually be there, boots on the ground, finding these things in real life, it's such a privilege to be able to do that. And Ethan and I have both exper experienced that. And I don't know, Ethan, when you were a kid, did you, like me, did you think that you would actually become a paleontologist later on in life? I mean, was this, tell us about that a little bit, those aspirations and how they became reality for you. I definitely did. Um, I definitely did feel, I mean, there was nothing else that I wanted to be. There was no close second at all, um, yeah. which is either, a, either disastrous or exactly <laughs> what you need to succeed. It just depends uh -huh. on, you know, <clears throat> yeah. um, so I feel very lucky in that way that it's turned out. Um, but yeah, I there were times where I didn't feel like, you know, maybe like as a teenager where it started to seem less plausible mm -hmm. as sort of a, uh, a a life goal. Um but I like what uh Jim says about this. He says a paleontologist is what a paleontologist does. I love that too. It's yeah. a great quote. Yeah. Um yeah, and there's some people that that say if you don't have a PhD in front of your name, you're not a paleontologist, which is a very strange uh, opinion to have. I agree. Opinion. Yeah, yeah. Shoot, I mean, Jack Horner wouldn't be a paleontologist if that were the case. You know, it's an honorary exactly. PhD. You know, doesn't count, right? So, yeah, yeah. If you're if you're yeah. actually doing work in the field, if you're publishing, if you're advancing scientific knowledge in that discipline, you are a paleontologist. That's the way that I count it. So. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, speaking of which, Ethan, since you are doing work in this field, you're advancing the discipline. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the places that you've gone recently? Because you've sent me text messages with pictures of various places that you've gone recently. Uh, where have you gone over the past you know, year or so, and uh, and what were you studying there? What are some of the things that uh, that people should know about the stuff that you've been up to, kind of world trotting in the uh, sure. in the service of fossil science? So, just a couple of weeks ago, I got back from London, London, England, and not London, Florida. Um, <laughs> and I was there for a conference at the Natural History Museum. Uh -huh. so there was that the two the second century or two hundred years of two hundred years have passed since the first dinosaur was named Megalosaurus Bucklandi eighteen twenty four. Yeah. So mm -hmm. there was this big conference at the Natural History Museum in London, um, where there were talks and there was this great fancy dinner and all kinds of uh, fun events to commemorate the two hundred years since the first dinosaur. So I I uh, flew to England to do that, and the town of Oxford is just maybe 60 miles away from London. Mm -hmm. So, and there's some really interesting dinosaur fossils at Oxford. It's one of the oldest, it, I guess it is the oldest collection of dinosaur fossils in the world. Yeah. Um, and I'm studying a giant theropod dinosaur called Torvosaurus from the Jurassic period. Yeah. And Let me go get it. most of the megalosaurid dinosaurs, the group that Torvosaurus belongs to, 
most of those are actually known from Europe, from England and from France and from Germany. So being in England, it was a really great opportunity to study some of Torvosaurus' closest relatives to help figure out exactly what are the features and traits that separate Torvosaurus from these other megalosaurids. So um, I got to see a bunch of skull bones from Megalosaurus. And in particular, I got to see the first dinosaur bone ever ever studied, basically ever studied, and the, the first dinosaur bone that served as a holotype or as the name-bearing specimen of a dinosaur species. So it's the, it's the lower jaw of Megalosaurus bucklandi that was named back in 1824. Then I got to see and study the original fossil, the first dinosaur ever, ever studied by science. So that was a pretty cool privilege. That is pretty um, Danny awesome. Danny here actually made me a terrific 3D print of that. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> There's a delay. Oh, you're good. You know, you know what's funny is I'm 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 watching the uh, uh, I'm watching the stream in a separate window because you're not present in the window I'm actually logged into. Oh shoot! So okay, that's yeah, probably yeah. Ex accentuating the my fault. I should stop looking at the at that video. Anyway, I don't know if that's actually um, affecting it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Too much. So. Yeah. Danny made me a... Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. So you, you made me a terrific 3D print of that lower jaw, which has been a great research aid for me. Um, but yeah, it was a bit like going to Mecca, going to see the first dinosaur fossil ever described. It was pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Doing the Hodge there. Seeing the first Megalosaurus specimen. Holy cow, 200 years since Buckland 1824. We need to do a special stream about that here. But um... Time flies. Yeah, yeah. When you when you saw the original one, did it look bigger than the one that I gave you, Ethan? Because I, in order to fit that on the print bed, I had to turn it down to like ninety eight percent instead of a hundred percent to get it to fit. Did it look bigger than the one that I gave you? I think uh, I think they're pretty close. Ninety eight percent is <laughs> that's a pretty subtle difference. So okay, good, 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 good. That's glad. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you I'm hear happy, that. I'm happy with my ninety eight. All right, all right, awesome. Yeah. Um, it was also I got to see uh, I got to see some interesting fossils in the Natural History Museum in London, which was cool. There was uh -huh. a big. So in in 1970, when Dale uh -huh. Russell named Despletosaurus, it's a giant yeah. tyrannosaur from Alberta, Lake Cretaceous. Despletosaurus terosus. He referred a bunch of fossils that had been collected. Exactly. Yeah, he'd referred yeah. a bunch of specimens that were collected decades before. To this new species so basically what he what he discovered was that among the fossils that people all assumed was gorgosaurus there were some that were different which he decided to name a new species despletosaurus uh -huh. one of the skulls that he referred to this new species despletosaurus was collected from alberta in the 1920s by william cutler and purchased by the natural history museum in london oh. and when russell named despletosaurus he said that this skull is also also belongs to this new species of Tyrannosaur, to Despletosaurus. Uh -huh. But nobody, to my knowledge, nobody had seen or studied this skull for since it was since 1970. Or at least there were no pictures of it on the internet. There was nothing written about it anywhere. People yeah. just kept saying it was a Despletosaurus because of that. So it was cool to go and actually see it. It was an articulated front two thirds of a skull, so both premaxillas, both maxillas, nasals both lower jaws, both denaries. So it was all of the business end of the animal's face. Um, and it was really cool to see. I was surprised no one's really worked on it. But uh, what I did find was that it actually lacks all of the synapomorphies or all the all the features that define Despletosaurus. Really? So it looks like Russell was probably incorrect in, in calling it a Despletosaurus, so probably just a Gorgosaurus. But it is this big, beautiful skull just sitting in a museum cabinet that People have not looked at for decades for some reason. So that was that was cool to see a little hidden treasure. Be because no one had mentioned it, I just assumed it was probably like in a thousand pieces. Yeah. And then the, the collections manager just, just pulls out this beautiful skull. I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. That's really really cool, Ethan. Holy cow! And so I don't know with with those of us here in the states when we hear about you know UK dinosaur paleontology, you know we've got this thing where I I frequently say that like. You know, in the UK, they have more dinosaur paleontologists than they have dinosaur fossils sometimes. So everybody's, like, fighting over these individual specimens and everything. It's kind of amazing that that one has not been studied 
Is it from uh, like the Red Deer River in Alberta yeah. or something like that? Do you know where it's from? It's from that area, yeah. So probably Dinosaur Park formation. Uh huh. Um, it looks like Gorgosaurus, so I would expect it to be Dinosaur Park. Although uh-huh. I don't think there's any really good locality data, just given that it was collected back in the 20s. Gotcha. But uh, yeah, yeah, you'd think they'd be fighting over that one. Yeah, yeah, that's surprising to hear. That's really, that, really that interesting. That trend stuff. is changing now. There are uh-huh. uh, the number of dinosaur paleontologists in the UK seems to be dwindling. Really? Um, it seems that's like most people are news. most paleo jobs, people are studying other things. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I think it's just like you said, they can't really they can't really get new specimens very easily. Yeah. And they don't have the enormous collections that we ha- like like we have in America. Uh huh. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot. So earlier on, uh, I think it was probably like two weeks ago, Ethan, we were looking at on Twitter, a, a picture that was posted, a photo of uh, people attending this conference in the UK. And you were there kind of toward the center, uh, like kind of like midway up. There was like a big auditorium. Everybody was sitting there and we could pick you out there. And that was pretty cool to be able oh, to see. Oh, that's funny. I can't find myself in that picture. Really? <laughs> I tried looking for myself. I couldn't. We had we had no trouble with that. It was yeah. You're you're kind of there toward the center of the the nice. crowd. I I think, yeah. Um, but that's uh, nice. yeah, yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Um, now we've got some other questions from uh from members of chat here, and uh, here's kind of a goofy one, Ethan. If you're ready for it, but. If you could go back to the era of Cope and Marsh, who would you work with and what modern knowledge would you spread to them? Probably Cope. He seemed a lot less insufferable, I think. <laughs> and I think Cope was probably the better scientist. Huh. Everybody says that. And I think Cope yeah. did a lot more field work himself. Uh-huh. Um... Like Sternberg writes about going out into the field with Cope for like months. Yeah. So maybe not when he was old, but it seems like he did a lot more field work than Marsh did. It seems like Marsh would just show up every once in a while when it was extremely necessary or like when he was mm-hmm. leading like a class or something. Yeah. Um, so I think Cope would be the man, although he was supposedly had terrible nightmares. So he probably would have kept you up at night. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had something said to do with he this. Like, just hear the horrific sounds. He would be he would be tossed in his nightmares by all the creatures that he dug up that he dug up within the day. Um yeah, yeah, I think it was Sternberg who wrote about that, wasn't it? Yeah. Um when I when I hear this question, I always I don't know. Everybody always says cope, so I always say marsh. Um maybe partly to be contrarian and partly because Marsh just worked on dinosaurs a little bit more exclusively than I think Cope did. Cope was like kind of all over the place. Cope was a genius, but you know, he's working on amphibians and fishes and, you know, and reptiles and dinosaurs and mammals and I don't know. I usually say Marsh, so when that time machine gets invented, I when he was like 12, right? Cope, yeah, holy cow. Cope was he he wrote a like he did these detailed illustrations of an ichthyosaur when he was like twelve years old, like he was a child prodigy, in a way that that Marsh really kind of wasn't. Um, but also like Cope grew up in like a wealthy family in the way that Marsh really didn't. Marsh had this wealthy uncle who like bought him a museum later on in life, but like Marsh had a fairly meager up- upbringing until uh, until that time. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, Ethan, did you ever hear about that? We've probably talked about this before. That that movie that uh, maybe HBO was going to make at one point about the Bone Wars, and they were they already started casting about it. And um, uh, what's his name? Michael Scott from The Office. Uh, uh, he was going to play Cope. And then James Gandolfini, Tony Soprano, was going to play Marsh in this. And that would have been... Nice. That would have been pretty awesome. But it, it never really came to fruition, because partly because James, James Gandolfini died. 
before that could happen. But um, Steve Carell, thank you, Lenina and Claire Burr. I'm gonna give yes. him a fuzzy camera fuse. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. That would have been really, really cool. I, I can only dream that something like that would would come about again. I mean, it's it's goofy, but like. Even goofy stuff like that can sometimes get people excited about fossil science. I mean, I've, I've been teaching on Saturdays. For the past three Saturdays, yeah. I've been teaching kids uh, about dinosaur science um, here locally. And, you know, they're all obsessed with Jurassic World and everything. And, you know, luckily none of them said that Indominus Rex was their favorite dinosaur. But the way that even goofy pop cultural things like that can, can kind of inflame their knowledge about fossil science is, it's really cool and special. And I, I'm kind of wondering, Ethan, like, um, what are your, your strategies when you're talking to people in the general public about science? How do you get them excited about these things? And, uh, like maybe what are some of your favorite facts to share with them about Mesozoic paleontology, especially in Utah, when you're talking to like a school group or something like that? Well, usually whenever I'm doing that, I have uh, fossils in front of me. Mm -hmm. So it's quite easy to have the kids kind of guide, like they'll just pick something up and be like, what's this? And then that, that lets you start. Um, uh-huh start a conversation that that they're kind of leading you know but what's usually what's really interesting is how obsessed or how surprised and amazed everyone is to find out that the fossils they're looking at are from from utah so people are very interested huh. in not just the history of the earth but people are very interested in what lived where they are at a certain time it's like oh my where right. i'm from is special uh -huh. in this way so yeah. people like you know it's kind of a point of pride in many cases which uh -huh. is terrific. Um, yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. I'm I'm involved with a project People, right now where... Lines. Yeah. Go for it. No, no, you're good. This, this, It's the lag. No worries. <laughs> yeah, I'm involved with a project right now where there's a local fossil site that's really, really special. Like the type locality for uh, a certain age of fossils. And like... I can't talk too much about it right now, but uh, depending on building a museum and that kind of thing. And I think I'm really, really hoping that that kind of local draw, that local pride will be really important to people. Um, yeah. Do, do you feel like people in Utah have any sense? Generally speaking, like the general public, your average Joe on the street, do they have any kind of idea that Utah is maybe the most dinosauriferous place in the U.S., if not in the world? I think... I think they may have... I think they know there are dinosaurs, but it seems like most people do not know how special it is. Uh-huh. Surprisingly. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Ontogeny. It's funny, in other places like Montana, I feel like people have a pretty good sense for that, but maybe they've had kind of a head start there, where, like, Jack Horner was working on dinosaurs at Egg Mountain back in the 80s and stuff, and outside of Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, I'm not sure if there are a lot of other places where, where that sort of information has made its way out to the public. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm really hoping that the Utah Geological Survey and the Museum and Price and other places can can really kind of do that kind of outreach uh, here in the 21st century. But um, anyway, yeah. Let me go on to another question here. Um, let's see here. Uh, well, here's one that's super relevant before you have to go, Ethan, because I know you might be running out of time. Jody Fish would like to know, how did last summer's dig season go in Wyoming? Presumably she means. And how many jackets did you end up taking back? It went ridiculously well. Uh, so we... 
I mean, it, it was almost like we just happened to find every fossil that we had that we needed to find. <laughs> it's um, amazing like that. Yeah. So we collected yeah. what looks like we collected what looks like most of a duckbill dinosaur skull, which is the most important part of the animal for figuring out what species you have is the head. Mm-hmm. And it looks like we got a large percentage of a head of a hadrosaur with all, with no bones from behind the head. So usually it's like you find little bits of the skeleton and hope, you know, you collect everything you find, of course. You hope to find a single a scrap skull of a skull. Good information. You know? Yeah. Like all we got was skull and nothing else. So it was like every minute we spent was definitely worth uh, the, the effort. From there, from the, the Skull Ridge site where we got the hadrosaur skull, we only collected three jackets. One jacket for the left lower jaw, one jacket for the right side of the lower jaw, and then one giant jacket for the rest of the head skeleton that had fallen apart into many pieces. So that's three there. We we also found the back part of a ceratopsian dinosaur frill, which is the most important part of the body for figuring out what species you have. So there's a good chance that that, that will be a holotype or the first example of a new species. That was one jacket. Um, we're going to be going back this summer to excavate at that ceratopsy and hopefully find more of the skull because there were actually little bits of bones still poking out of the hill um, uh, at that site last year. We were just limited in the amount of rock we could move because we were only allowed to move a square meter at that site. But this year we'll be able to move yards and yards worth of so we've got meters an excavation permit, I should say, there. Of, of sediment. It's in the works. Yeah, it's being expedited. So, fantastic! That is so exciting to hear. Um, so um, we also collected yeah. super exciting. We also collected dozens of really nice plant fossils. So the, the the flora from the almond formation is really not known at all, even though collections have been made. We collected a lot of really great invertebrate fossils. We found some really toward the end. We found some really extraordinary turtles and fish and crocs croc pieces. So it's really exciting to sort of round out what the ecosystem looks like. This year, we're going to be putting a ton of effort into finding more of these turtles, fish, crocodiles, um, and plants at this one particular locality, which is unbelievably productive. Um, And it's going to tell us all kinds of things about the the contextual information. Like um, we have things like, like bowfin fish, like amiads, this giant six or seven foot long kind of amiad called Melvius. We collected this really cool turtle shell. It's about this big, and it's got a dozen crocodile tooth marks um, up and going up and down the length of the shell. And so you can actually see the outline of the crocodile's jaw into in the shape of tooth marks. Um, got a bunch of uh, we found our first crocodile osteoderm. So that's like one of the little the bony scutes in the back, but you know crocodiles have those spikes going up and down their tail and their back. And we found one of the little bony cores of one of those, and it's pretty cool looking. I haven't seen an osteoderm quite like this. Um, and we, yeah, so it went extremely well. Um, yeah, so kind yeah. of beyond our wildest dreams. So very, this very year cool. we have, we have two articulated hadrosaur skeletons. So two duckbill skeletons where at least part of the skeleton is together, where the bones are together as they were in life. And those are just waiting for us to go and collect them. Uh, we've also got, yeah. That, that Ceratopsian skull to finish as well. And we're hopefully we're going to have enough people to have to be working at four sites at the same time and then a few extra to go prospecting looking for more fossils, more sites. So it's really, shaping really exciting. up to be pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, shoot. And Ethan, can you talk at all about, it's okay if you can't, but about the uh, the researchers who might be joining us from uh, from Pennsylvania this year? I talked a little bit about this, but uh, it's kind of cagey yeah. about it. Yeah. Sure. So it looks like uh, Matt Lamana, Dr. Matt Lamana of the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It looks like he's going to come out with us. He's trying to come for the entire duration of the dig, Holy which would be really great. He's done field work. He's actually leading a field project right now in Antarctica, looking for dinosaurs of roughly similar age to the almond formation, but in Antarctica. Huh. He's also heavily involved in field work in Africa and in Patagonia in Argentina. And he's got a long track record of working in China as well. So he's a, in Egypt. So he, he was part of the first team of paleontologists to go back to Egypt 
since the first dinosaurs were found there in the 1910s. Um, so he's got a, he's a really terrific dino expert and he's going to be helping us uh, find the fossils. He's going to be helping us prepare or clean up the fossils at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. So that's a, a really great, uh, really great alliance to have. The Skull Ridge Hadrosaur is currently being prepared it through the, uh, you can see it through the glass at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. And um, yeah, as well, so is the Ceratopsian. So the Ceratopsian and the Hadrosaur are going to be cleaned so that the public can go and see them get cleaned and see these new dinosaurs be revealed for the first time. That's awesome. I didn't know that the Ceratopsian and was we there may, in Cincinnati may as well. also have Glenn Stoppers yeah. coming out with us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, they got the, <laughs> the They're in the, the viewing lab. That's yeah. so cool. That's so cool. Um, yeah. What an honor. Yeah. Um, and Glenn Storrs as well. Can you tell us a little bit about who Glenn Storrs is? Yeah, Glenn, Glenn is the curator of the, the paleontology curator at the Cincinnati Museum Center, which is where all the fossils that we're collecting are eventually going to end up. And so Glenn uh, got his PhD from Yale, but um, under John Ostrom, who was the paleontologist who essentially just discovered that um, dinosaurs or that birds evolved from dinosaurs back in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. And so Glenn has done a ton of research on all kinds of fossil reptiles. He's, you could probably say he's, uh, he's done plenty of work on dinosaurs, but he's probably most known for his work on marine reptiles. So like plesiosaurs and nothosaurs and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and also as, as well as crocodiles and other things and fish. So he's a very well-rounded paleontologist and he'll probably be joining us for a period of that time as well, which would be great. That's really he's cool. He's done a lot of work in Russia because he actually speaks Russian. So he's done um, a lot of work in collections and in the field in Russia, which is which is fun. Very, very cool. Holy cow. I'm really excited for that. I mean, and it, it looks like we're going to be starting as soon as like the beginning of June this year, right? That's what you were texting me about earlier. Yeah, I'm hoping to do the whole month. That is really exciting. So with any luck, cross your fingers that the Starlink continues to work, but we should be able to broadcast this live for everybody to be, able to be able to watch at home and do some some serious science outreach here so pretty excited about that yeah yeah um oh i should mention um obviously it's, it's obviously not news to chat but we were uh -huh. able to pull off that amazing success because of paleontologizing fans who yeah um helped us raise a ton of money for the field work so you Thank guys you, yeah. fed us you supplied us, you got us the gas money, you got us the the vehicles we needed to get everything around. So it was totally couldn't have done it without y'all. So thank you. Thank you. In, very, in a couple very of years, yeah. you should see the fruits of your labor be uh, in the form of beautiful pictures and papers about these really cool fossils. So excited for that. It's, uh, oh man, cannot wait. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, if anybody is in... Uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, they might be able to go to the Carnegie Museum and see some of these fossils prepared in real time there in the viewing lab, right? Absolutely. They're just about to crack open the Ceratopsian soon. And one of the Skull Ridge Hadrosaur lower jaws is already visible through the lab. You sent me it's pictures pretty, of that, Ethan. Pretty sweet. It is exquisite. I cannot... Oh, man. Uh, thank you again for sending that. Ethan. It's jumbo. And, uh, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully this year we can go and find where that ankylosaur is coming out of the ground. Those uh, those bits of osteoderms and stuff like that, where we we tried to find the source of that and we couldn't this year before we had to leave. That would be really really cool because an ankylosaur from the almond formation is almost guaranteed to be a new genus or species, and that would be really cool too. So new hadrosaur. Yeah. Do you recall where that? Yeah. Where did you hear um or sorry, where did you see ankylosaur bits? Oh, it was uh it was along the road as we were driving up to the hadrosaur uh post oh, site. Yeah. Yeah. At Fisher yeah, the site that Fisher found. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah that yeah. may be that may be an ankylosaur. I'm not sure. But uh -huh. we actually we know we have an ankylosaur for sure at a different site that's much closer to town. And we collected oh. just right on the surface. Parts of three large notosaurid osteoderms. 
And we actually <laughs> we actually do have an excavation permit for that site. We just haven't gotten around to it because there's so much to do. So but we're so going to do that do this summer. It's like. just waiting for us to go get it. That is super exciting. That is super exciting. If we have the time. There's a lot. To, uh, yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Holy moly. Well, I want to be really respectful of your time here, Ethan. It's 6.02 my time, which means it's 7.02 your time. Do you have to Do you have to run, or can you stick around for a little I'm while? A, I'm, not in a, I'm not in any particular rush. Okay. So if, you, cool, if, cool, you, cool. Uh, if anyone has any more questions, I'm happy to stay longer. We've got other questions for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, let's see. Smay wants to know, can you tell if someone has dug fossils from a location before and do people leave notes or markers? Maybe you can talk a little bit about Barnum Brown and his work in this area and uh, and why it's maybe been largely unexplored up until the past couple of years when you started working there. Yeah, so usually when people find fossils in a particular place, they'll produce, they'll publish scientific papers about it. And so that enters the scientific record so you can read and learn about fossils from different places, right? So you can know, oh, someone found this fossil and they studied it and it came from here. Um, in the case of where we're working, we know that in the 1930s, Barnum Brown of the American Museum of Natural History, who was one of the most famous and successful dinosaur collectors that ever lived. He collected the first T-Rex ever found, for example. He led an expedition there in 1937, and they found a ton of fossils, um, but nothing ever really became of those fossils in Brown's lifetime. So they found parts of a bunch of duck-billed dinosaur skeletons. They found a nice, a nice ceratopsian skull, um, just missing the frill. Um, and then... Brown published a popular article about the expedition, but then nothing ever happened uh, with that material until the 2000s when some paleontologists started going into the collections and looking at that stuff and studying it again for the first time. And that's actually how I heard about the almond formation was by these papers by other scientists who had studied uh, the, the collections that Brown had made from there. Um, so Brown kept really terrible notes. Uh, he was kind of famous <laughs> yeah. for keeping basically no record of very, of the details of the field work. But so he did have an assistant who kept, kept records during the expedition in 1937 to the Almond formation. And that information I've gotten able, I've been able to see. So I've been able to see roughly where uh, within a quarter mile, where most of the dinosaurs came from. And we've actually used that to rediscover some of Brown's quarries, which is really cool. But we also found uh, in 2022, we found an articulated hadrosaur skeleton um, just coming out of this sandstone bench. And Brown's notes didn't indicate that he had found an animal there, but all these bones were piled up in these very strange ways. And there was a big pile of sand right next to the skeleton. And then we looked and we realized there was actually a rusty bucket with a giant sagebrush growing out of it right next to the dinosaur. So it seems like Barnum Brown must have found this skeleton and then played with it a little bit, dug a pit, decided it wasn't worth his time, and then left without ever having a record of, of, of that event. Um, we're going to collect this specimen this year because it actually is, looks pretty nice. It's in a really hard ironstone, but it's the kind of ironstone that can actually be prepared away, and it can actually protect the fossils in some sense. There's a, and we know that there is at least some parts of the skull. There's an upper jawbone preserved in place in the sandstone. And there's about 15 tail vertebrae and ribs all articulated next to each other. Um, so it's probably a nice skeleton just sitting there waiting for us to dig up. So we're going to do that this year. That's really exciting stuff, Ethan. Um, and I'm, so I that, really... that was a rare opportunity to see trash from the, the great man himself. <laughs> Kind of combining paleontology and archaeology there too, where we're you know we're doing paleoarchaeology, in that sense, finding a, a bucket left by Barnum Brown, really really cool stuff. Um, yeah, holy cow, and and so maybe for uh for those of the members of chat who are not aware of this kind of thing, where do these fossils end up after we're done with them, and how do we ensure that they are? available for scientific study 
long after we're gone. Talk about the repository, I guess, for these. So the fossils are from Bureau of Land Management lands. And so all fossils from public or federal lands in America technically belong to the federal government. And by extension, they belong to citizens of the United States. So they're not, so they're off of the market. They will never be bought or sold. So they have to go into a permanent, what we call a repository or a, a university or museum that has a collection of fossils that where they take care of the fossils so that people can go and visit them on display or so scientists can come in and study them. So these fossils will permanently end up in the collections of the Cincinnati Museum Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And they've already got a pretty great dinosaur collection there. And so we're going to be adding to that um, continuously. Yeah. Pretty cool stuff. And SVP was in Cincinnati this year, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Um, I didn't get to go this year, but you did, Ethan. How it was, was that uh, kind of like showing off that museum to the the vertebrate paleontology community at large? It was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a great meeting. A lot of great talks. Um, so the socializing was terrific. <laughs> and I have a lot of family there as well, so it was nice uh, to do get a bit of both worlds. That's but, pretty um, cool. I got to give a talk on Torvosaurus, which is the specimen that's housed at the Cincinnati Museum Center. So it was cool because on the welcome reception night, everyone just gets beers and they go into the museum and look at the dinosaurs together and eat macaroni and cheese. And so it was cool to uh, give a talk about a specimen that everybody was gawking at the day the day before. So that was cool. That is really, really neat. Yeah. Shoot, could you talk for a minute maybe about Torvosaurus and why you're interested in that animal and what it means for, like, Morrison Formation Ecology and that kind of thing? Give us an intro. What is Torvosaurus? So Torvosaurus is a, a gigantic theropod or predatory dinosaur. And so most, so most of the big predatory dinosaurs... They're either a group that we call Solorosaurs, which includes the raptors, the tyrannosaurs, and birds, and some of their relatives. Or, and then we also have other, other, groups, other groups of theropods within a big group called tetanurans, um, but that don't actually evolve into birds or into anything really close to birds. So T-Rex, for example, is more closely related to a chicken than T than uh, than it is to the Allosaurus that uh, Danny just touched with his hand, yeah. and so Torvosaurus is a lot closer to Allosaur to Allosaurus than it is to a T Rex or a thing like a bird. Um, so Torvosaurus is basically a gigantic, thirty five foot long, maybe three or four ton predatory dinosaur from the late Jurassic period in North America and Iberia, Spain and Portugal, and. It, uh, it lived in the exact same time and place as Allosaurus. So we have Allosaurus in the late Jurassic in North America and in Spain and Portugal. So they lived side by side for p perhaps a few million years. And tor from what we understand, Torvosaurus is bigger than most specimens of Allosaurus, although Allosaurus does get huge if they live long enough. Um, but Torvosaurus is an extremely rare dinosaur. So whereas Allosaurus is known from many, many dozens of specimens, Torvosaurus is really only known from a handful. In fact, Allosaurus was named, I think, in 1877, and Torvosaurus wasn't named until 1979. So that gives you an idea of how rare this dinosaur must have been, given that people were collecting dinosaurs from the late Jurassic in North America for more than a century before they found a good Torvosaurus skeleton. So Torvosaurus is... A, is it's got a very long, low skull. It has very, very few teeth in its jaws. That's what kind of one of the things that this new specimen is telling us is that it has a very reduced number of teeth. It's got an extremely narrow snout. And the snout and, and the back of the head, like in a Tyrannosaurus, the back of the head is very broad. In Torvosaurus, it's almost like just a rectangle all the way back, just a narrow rectangle. Um, it had extremely robust, short, very, very powerful arms. So it's got these huge ridges and bumps on the arms that are serve as attachment sites for muscles that really just blow the arms of Allosaurus out of the water. So 
Allosaurus makes T-Rex arms look ridiculous. Torvosaurus make Allosaurus arms look completely ridiculous. Um, and so most specimens of Torvosaurus were known from this bone bed in western Colorado, uh, collected in the 1970s by Brigham Young University. And they had multiple skeletons kind of jumbled up and about maybe 40% of a skull. So they had the very front of the snout, they had the upper jawbone, broken pieces of the bones that surround the eyes, and a little bit of the lower jaw. And then in, in uh, let's see, 2014, a new skeleton of Torvosaurus was found from near Dinosaur National Monument, just outside of the monument. And this specimen is 55% complete. So it may actually be the single most complete skeleton of a megalosaurid dinosaur ever found. And remember, the first dinosaur ever named was Megalosaurus. So that's in the same family as Torvosaurus. So it's pretty amazing that a really, really nice skeleton of a Megalosaurid has eluded us um, until the late 2010s. Um, so this specimen, the skull is not very complete, but it has the first ever complete upper jawbone. So it's got a complete maxilla. And it's the only Megalosaurid dinosaur that has a complete upper jawbone. It's also got most of the back part of the lower jaw, which is a region that has not been found in basically any other megalosaurid dinosaur. When I was in Oxford recently, I saw part of a lower jaw that had been attributed to megalosaurus, but I got to looking at it and I was like, this is actually a crocodile jaw. So it had been <laughs> referred to megalosaurus just because it's from the same rock formation. So there's all these different, all these different isolated bones from the same formation that have all been lumped into megalosaurus. And it seems like the upper jaws and the lower jaws that have been called megalosaurus, they seem to have a common morphology, a common anatomy. So it seems like, okay, we do know that there is this thing called megalosaurus. This is what the upper jaw looks like. This is what the lower jaw looks like. But the very back of the lower jaw, the part that hooks onto the skull, um, that piece happens to be probably not a dinosaur at all. So that makes the, the new specimen of Torvosaurus even more uh, scientifically significant because it's the first time we get to see what does the back of the jaw look like. And it looks very strange. Um, it uh, The articular bone, which is what the skull, uh, what the bone that attaches the lower jaw to the skull, is oriented at a totally oblique angle. So whereas in like an Allosaurus, as, as you can see with the specimen behind Danny, or you probably can't see this feature from, from where you're sitting, but... Um, the, the articular is totally flat. And then in Torvosaurus, it's totally oblique for some reason. So the, the jaw would have hooked into the head at a very weird angle. Um, it's got a huge fenestra in the lower jaw. So Danny, if you want to point to the external mandibular fenestra on the Allosaurus there. Uh, right here. So in yeah. Torvosaurus, uh, right there, yeah. In Torvosaurus, that hole is gigantic. And then in Allosaurus, it's really greatly reduced. Um, it's also at, at the top margin of the back of the lower jaw, Danny. So that's the serangular there. You can see yep. it's like elevated. There's a bump. Yeah, right there. Right There's there. a bump right there. And that yeah. seems to be for anchoring jaw muscles, uh -huh. um, the, jaw, the muscles that close the jaw. In Torvosaurus, that area is totally flat. So there's all these weird skeletal adaptations that we're starting to see from Torvosaurus that is kind of making me think, you know, this thing is really specialized for something, and what it is, I really don't know. But I have a feeling it wasn't very good at it, whatever it was, because they're <laughs> they they go extinct at the end of the Jurassic period. Whereas, right. uh, whereas things like Allosaurus, I'm just plug, I'm gonna plug my computer in real quick. Sorry. No, you're that. good. You're good. Yeah, Shuffle take your time. Here. Yeah, it's interesting. Like Whoop. Megalosaurids go extinct, and Spinosaurids, their closest relatives, also go extinct. So Spinosaurids, a group that I'm working on. They also go extinct in like the early Cretaceous period. They just completely get wiped out. And uh, we're still kind of figuring this out. Like, why is that? The, the mid Cretaceous extinction event is one of those things that has been really, really understudied. And even Jim talks about this all the time. Uh, there's something bizarre that happened there, like at the end of the Cenomanian epoch, that just. We don't really have any understanding of this so far. Or at least I'm not aware of any understanding of this. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool stuff. So, so another interesting thing about... Yeah. Like you were saying about Spinosaurus. Uh-huh. 
Um, so like you said, spinosaurids and megalosaurids, they seem to, they cluster together in a lot of evolutionary tree analyses, a lot of phylogenetic trees. Some people have started to indicate that they may actually not be sister, sister clades, but Ooh. you know, we'll, we'll figure that out as we go. Um, but the new skull of Torvosaurus, what it's kind of showing us is that megalosaurids had a very spinosaurid-like snout. Huh. So spinosaurids seem extremely specialized, and they certainly are. Their maxilla and premaxilla and nasal, their their facial bones and their lower jaw is just like completely, ridiculously long. Um, but because megalosaurid skulls have been so scrappy and incomplete, it's been kind of hard to figure out what a big adult skeletally mature megalosaurid skull looks like and because the tortorvosaurus skull parts from the first quarry found in the 70s appear to be from an individual that is about the same size as the new cincinnati specimen we've been able to put all of those bones together into a composite reconstruction and it looks like torvosaurus although not even close to the extreme elongation and and lateral compression that you see in the snout of a spinosaur it's starting to suggest that these it, it's not hard to figure out how something that is closely related to Torvosaurus would evolve into something like Spinosaurus. So it could be that this sort of elongated snout is a basal characteristic to the clade that includes Megalosaurus and Spinosaurus. And maybe it means that Megalosaurs are behaving a bit more like Spinosaurus because Spinosaurus also supposedly have very, or not supposedly, Baryonyx has extremely robust arms, very oh, yeah. similar to Torvosaurus. And it seems as though the evidence is pretty strong that spinosaurs are consuming fish. So it could be that Torvosaurus and other megalosaurids, because they go extinct at the end of the Jurassic, it could be that they're kind of being spinosaur-like in their ecosystems uh, before spinosaurs were really doing it themselves. But Interesting. it's hard to say for now. So they, they we know for sure that megalosaurids go extinct at the end of the Jurassic, like... Uh... Is that incontrovertible at this point? Torvosaurus is the youngest megalosaur. Wow. Shoot. We don't have any any megal any megalosaur from the Cretaceous. So Afrovenator, which Serino described from Niger, yeah. uh -huh. he was originally named as being from the early Cretaceous, but then yeah. people looked at the stratigraphy again and realized that that's actually Middle Jurassic. Afrovenator is from the Middle Jurassic? Holy so they, cow. So they totally die out. <laughs> that changes everything. I had no idea. That's That's really, really cool. Shoot. I did not know that. Um, well, darn. Really neat, Ethan. I should look at the time again. It's 6.20 right now, my time, which means it's 7.20 your time. I want to be respectable of, of your time. Do you have to run right now, or can you uh, can you continue for a while? No worries if you have to run. I'm, uh, I'm good to stay, as long as, I'm, as, long as uh, there's stuff to... As long as you're not bored of me. Oh, there! It's gonna take us a long time for. You're gonna have to go before we get bored of you. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, we've got a a question from Velocity Lanes right here. They want to know: Would you ever write a book, whether solo or with another paleontologist? And I guess, what would it be about? So far, according to what you've what you've specialized in the, you know, in the world of paleontology, Ethan, what would you feel most qualified to write a book about? It would be really fun to write. I don't know. I think it'd be really fun to publish like a photographic atlas of really cool fossils. Huh. Like a um, coffee table book? Big, big photographic book? Like... Yeah, I mean, exactly, yeah. Just like, I mean, fossils are beautiful objects and they're scientifically interesting. So like they combine aesthetics and science and fascination yeah. and that kind of thing. It'd be yeah. really cool just to have like a really cool coffee table book of just extraordinary fossils. That'd be fun. I like that um, idea. But I think as far as a book with text, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be really cool to write a book about the last 20 million years of the age of dinosaurs. So huh. the late Cretaceous period. So the time when Western North America was just a skinny island and a big seaway Laramidia. cut North America down the middle. It'd yeah. be really fun to, to write about sort of the history of exploration and study and sort of the questions that scientists now get to ask and um, 
and hopefully eventually answer about about those ecosystems so that you know tyrannosaurs hadrosaur duckbills ceratopsians the bonehead pachycephalosaurs the armored ankylosaurs these kinds of ecosystems the last groups of dinosaurs before they went extinct because that's, that's what answer. we find in in places like like in the almond formation in Wyoming. very cool very cool i like that a lot yeah um good stuff i'm sure a lot of people in chat would be interested in in buying either of those books if they were to go into print um yeah yeah we've got a question from the dinosaur dave too what would you like to find this field season i think dinosaur dave means in the almond formation of wyoming uh if you could find anything at all you know blue sky here what would you what would you like to find ethan go nuts I would like to find so we're gonna go we're gonna go back to where the ceratopsian frill came from. So I would very much like to find more of that ceratopsian skull. That would be a dream come true. Have it's we in got really an excavation soft rock. It's in mudstone. We will we will by that time. So because Ooh. that site is within a quarter mile of Skull Ridge, uh-huh. they have a system where you can expedite excavation permits for areas that are within the same quarter section. Nice. So it's gonna it's so it's in it's in progress right now. So they don't need to do another analysis. So it'll it'll definitely be done in time, which is really great news. Fantastic. Um, I mean, I would love to have enough of a new enough of a skull of a new ceratopsian species to mount it and see what this thing really looks like. Um, we're also going to be collecting another duckbill skeleton with tons of skin on it. So it's an articulated skeleton. The legs are articulated. There's a foot that's got skin all over it. There's a leg that's got skin all over it. There's big blocks of sandstone with skin impressions from the side of the animal where you can see the skin wrinkle around the ribs of the desiccated carcass. And there's giant bones of the animal going straight into the sandstone exactly where it came, where it's eroding out of. So I would love more than almost anything else to find the rest or the front half of that hadrosaur going into the sandstone all articulated with tons of skin and hopefully a skull. That would be really great. That's a really exciting thought. Yeah. Do you have any idea, Ethan, why uh, it seems like duckbill dinosaurs seem to preserve as mummies or seem to preserve with skin more often than other kinds of dinosaurs? I mean, we've all heard the rumors about this kind of thing, but do you have like... Uh... They see... Yeah. Yeah. Let, let us know. It could be something to do with the thickness of their hide. Maybe duckbills uh-huh. had really thick skin, and so it was more likely to be conducive to uh, fossilization. They also, I know some people are skeptical of this, but they do seem to occur in sandstone more frequently than ceratopsians do or other kinds of dinosaurs. Um, for example, I mean, every almost every hadrosaur that we found has been in a hard uh, sandstone channel in the almond formation. Um, it's not always the case, for sure, but what happens is in that's the kind of environment that's really conducive to the preservation of soft tissues. Right. So, right, the animal dies, or and it maybe gets cooked in the sun for a little while, then it gets buried in a channel sand, maybe that channel dries up, and the impression of the skin in the soft sand hardens, and then that may turn into a sandstone that gets compacted and cemented and that preserves the skin. It could be that. It could be a combination of factors. Uh, maybe yeah. So it could be that maybe they have thicker, tougher hide, and maybe they prefer to live in rivers more than other dinosaurs, and maybe that combines to make it more likely that they uh, have skin preserved. I, I'm not not totally sure, but it, it does seem to be much more common with hadrosaurs. Right. That's a good answer, and it's I've heard the same thing from other researchers too. I'm a little skeptical of that idea myself that they're like, oh, they always live near flood, you know fluvial environments but like because i found hadrosaurs in in mudstones as well but all the best ones are always from sandstone yeah me too they occur yeah 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 Yeah. and i i have not i don't think i've ever collected a ceratopsian from sandstone but that's it certainly happens um like nasuto ceratops that ceratopsian from the kaparowitz was collected in a very hard sandstone and it's covered in skin Uh uh-huh so yeah, yeah. I found Triceratops specimens in sandstones before, and like that one of the ones was uh, well, actually I didn't find that one, but there was one that like had 
potential keratin over the frill, and that was from a sandstone as well. And that's uh, nice. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, we've got a a question about fossil mammals. If you're willing to to field that one, Ethan. Um, have you come uh, come across any large or small mammals during excavations? And I mean, shoot, any mammals from the Mesozoic are bound to be small. But uh, yeah, in your various digs over the years, what kind of mammal material have you found, I guess? I have never seen a mammal fossil in the Mesozoic in my life. In the Really? Field. Wow, holy cow. Yeah. In, muse in museum collections, I've seen plenty, but I've never... I've been collecting dinosaurs for nine or ten years. I've never once seen a mammal in the and, in the ground. And I want to clarify for the chat: this is not a commentary on the prolificness of Ethan's collecting. It's just that mammals tend to be really rare in the Mesozoic. They were like minor players in their ecosystems, especially in Cretaceous North America. Um, I've I found a handful of mammal jaws and teeth, and sometimes even limb bones in the Judith River and the Hell Creek, but that's like nice. working on on microsites for like days and days and days. That's after collecting dozens and maybe hundreds of gar scales and lizard jaws and stuff like that until you finally come across a piece of a mammal. But um, yeah, shoot, if we found any, yeah, yeah, mostly with Denver, yeah, um, Denver Fowler for those of you in chat who are wondering. But uh, man, if we found any mammal material in uh and the almond that would be pretty stellar so we've got a few microsites to work and we're going to be we looking collected for more a this lot year. of them yeah exactly so we have we have tons of sediment that we collected from these microsites and nick had a funny quote where he said the rule of thumb is it's 50 pounds of matrix per mammal tooth and we got about <laughs> 50 pounds of matrix so hopefully uh -huh. as we sift through the, all that dirt, maybe a mammal tooth will show up. Right. Yeah. Uh, and do you have plans to do that? Are there people working on that? Where Are people going to be sieving through this stuff in the near future? I would love for that to happen. I just don't have anyone to do that, unfortunately. Yeah. I talk about this all the time. It's got We're bags like, of dirt sitting there. Yeah. In, in vertebrate paleontology, like we have material and we have fossils out there in the field there's just most of our shortages are like of funds and of labor you know um yeah yeah speaking of funds we had some people in the chat wondering if there will be another fundraiser for uh for this summer's field work in the almond uh before we leave are you uh you planning on doing that do we have any grants ready to go or uh is this going to be another crowdfunded kind of a deal here? What are you thinking, Ethan? I have not. I've written no grants. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but I think. I think. The, I think the move, experiment.com is a terrific. It's a terrific way to get your name out there to get people to contribute. Oh yeah. But they they do take a quite a sizable cut of the money that's raised. So I think it might be easiest just to kind of go straight to Venmo um, oh, or PayPal or something like that. Okay, um, okay. It might just be more straightforward. And then, then there's no stress about uh, – When they'll get yeah, the money to you no and everything stress like we were worrying about, about last um, year. Yeah, like – Exactly, yeah. It's just cleaner. Yeah. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. So if we do run another paleontologizing fundraiser this summer for our field work in the almond formation – digging up these new dinosaurs and other critters. It might be straight Venmo or PayPal or something like that. That's, I kind of like that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, good to know. Maybe in, uh, by the time April or May roll around, we'll have to put something together for that. And now that I've got some lead time, it'd be great. I can make that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That'd be awesome. Very good. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Rizu Dega says, we already have Ethan's Venmo, so uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I guess I, I guess I did read it over chat. I forgot. 
What's that? That's funny. I said, I, I guess I did read it over chat out loud already. Oh, That's no funny. worries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 And we've got another great question from Velocity Lanes. I think this kind of applies to both of us. Velocity Lanes wants to know, my little cousins are really into dinosaurs. What do you think is the best way to encourage them to learn more about dinosaurs without having them lose interest? In your experience, Ethan, how did you manage to maintain an interest in fossil science? Because, I mean, it started with it at a very young age for you, right? How did you not lose that to the current point where you are today? You, what you need is, a, I guess this is not really a factor because of the internet, but you need more and more stuff to read and look at and see. Yeah. Right? If you have one dusty dino book from first grade, it might not keep you going through fourth and fifth grade and sixth grade in high school. Yeah. Um, so by, you know, staying furnished with new dino books and uh, watching fresh Twitch chats like this one, Twitch streams like this one, <laughs> and going to museums as often as you can and getting involved yourself. So meeting paleontologists and volunteering for museums, that kind of thing. That's a great way to keep it keep it going. If you don't have people to do stuff with, you know, uh, it's quite hard to maintain a real burning interest in something because it's, and it's kind of how we evolved. Like we, we evolved to do stuff together. So Social having species. a network yeah. of people who are also interested in paleontology and like to do it, it kind of keeps it all going. You keep each other going. So, yep. That's good advice. Yeah, I mean, shoot, having that kind of like community, even if it's virtual, like here on Twitch, um, that counts for something. But this is like the advice that I always give, like, see if you can volunteer in a museum or something like that. Be where other people are doing fossil science. It, it, it counts for an awful lot. And it's easier today than I think it's ever been with the internet. So that's good advice, Ethan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, let me look at other questions here. Hang on a second. Um, let's see here. Hang on just a second, even. Got technical difficulties. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I think kind of drilling down deeper into that. Um, Ethan, can you tell us a story maybe about when you were a young person interested in paleontology? When did you first realize that you wanted to be a paleontologist? And thinking back to that time, what are some other pieces of advice that you could give to young people who might be watching this broadcast right now who want to become paleontologists themselves? I would say probably first grade. That sounds right. Yeah. Um, so was that six or seven? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I'm sure I had a, like a three-year-old dinosaur phase, but uh, I think it's probably around first grade where I decided that this would be a, a cool way to spend one's life. Uh -huh. um, I would say just keep learning. Just keep learning about it as much as you possibly can. And then just, Try to stay up to date with dino news. So there's every time a new story comes out, it's kind of a new lead that you can follow to learn about a new group or a new team that's making a discovery or some new technique or something like that. So realizing that dinosaur science or paleo in general is, even though we're studying very old things, it's a very modern subject and there's so much happening right now. So what paleontology looked like 10 years ago is not what it looks like today. And so being up on dino news can really keep you interested and motivated and remind you kind of viscerally uh, to get it into the back of your head that uh, paleontology is very much alive and it's thriving and growing and there's a lot to do and, and, and a lot to learn. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. I talk about that all the time. Shoot, do you, you might be, I don't know. I might be a little bit older than you on this front, Ethan, but do you remember those Dorling Kindersleeve videos? Uh, DK, you know, science, they had a dinosaurs one and they had a space one and skeleton and volcano and these other videos like this, you, you might know, not know what I'm talking about, but 
these were like really, really influential for I a lot of people books, at the time. The, the DK books. Yeah, the eyewitness, DK eyewitness. Nice. Uh, they had a video series as well, VHS tapes, like when I was a kid. And uh, they had a whole series, nice. probably like a dozen of them. And the dinosaur one, we've actually watched a couple times here uh, on my channel. And I feel like out of all of the different ones that exist, you know, planets and, you know, mammals and reptiles and volcano and blah, blah, blah. The dinosaur one has got to be the most grievously medieval, outdated. Medieval warfare. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, And, it, it, you know, they're still charming. And I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, disparaging them at all. But it's kind of amazing how much dinosaur science has advanced. And it is such a quickly evolving field. There are, you know, things that nobody would have dreamt of 20 years ago that we are finding today. There are, you know, new methods that are being devised. Isotopic analysis or like, looking at melanosomes to determine fossil color and stuff like that. When I was a kid, this stuff was unfathomable. And, you know, nowadays it's it's becoming matter of course. And that's really, really cool. So I think that's some really good advice. Like, you know, if you're a young person, you want to become a paleontologist, keep up with the news as much as you can and just read as much as you can. And get yourself into a museum if you can volunteer there when you get old enough, because that is uh that is huge. Yeah. Yeah. Um and what's great about dinosaurs is that you start learning about dinosaurs and then you start learning about all kinds of other stuff because paleontology is so thoroughly interdisciplinary. So a kid or a or anybody who gets really interested in dinosaurs is learning all kinds of stuff about evolution and animals and biology and geology and earth history. Um, and so it's, it's just sort of all these new and amazing ideas and concepts um, and fields kind of open up for you. Um, not even, I mean, even for, in, I mean, in my case, it's like almost anything that I know about science is because it's somehow connects back to dinosaurs in some way me too you know? yeah absolutely um, yeah so it really is wonderful for that yeah uh, we have a, a saying here on this channel that like paleontology is like a gateway science you know and not in a nefarious way it's not like we're you know lurking in an alley with a trench coat being like hey kid you want to learn about some fossils or something but <laughs> it is a way to it's like the, drop the paleontological agenda <laughs> exactly right <laughs> But it, it's a way to, to draw people into science, and uh, that's really, really cool. Um, not everybody, not all scientists, I think, can claim that. You know, if you're, like, in, uh, I don't know, you're looking at fluid dynamics in physics or something like that, that's not something that's really going to draw young people Good into luck. science. Yeah, exactly. Even though it would be really important, it's not something that's, you know, capturing the imaginations of fourth graders. Um, so yeah, to a certain extent, we've got a, a kind of a responsibility as paleontologists to, to reach out to the public and, and bring new people in. And, um, uh, yeah, yeah. D I don't know if this is old hat, but Ethan, do you want to give a shout out to your, uh, your YouTube channel about this? Cause I know you were doing some, some outreach at one point and I think people would like oh, to I'm see good. that now that they've gotten a chance to know you. No, no worries. Not, not, uh, I don't really plug it anymore, but okay. it's all good. No worries. No worries. Yeah, that's all good. Um, I'll probably let you go in a few minutes because we've been going for like a full 40 minutes after I, I told you we would, uh, we'd wrap this up. But, um, yeah. Anyway, any other closing thoughts or anything? Or, um, when, when can people look out maybe for, oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Tell us. So when we when we drove the fossils from Wyoming to the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh a few months uh -huh. ago, we got to go into the basement, into the collections of the Carnegie Museum, and we got to see the first T. Rex specimen ever collected. So the name bearing specimen of T. Rex. Holotype. That was one thing yeah. I forgot to mention earlier when we were talking about cool stuff. Yeah. That I've seen. Yeah. So that was pretty sweet to get to see that the T. Rex holotype is pretty amazing. Have you ever been to the Carnegie, Danny? I've never been to the Carnegie. I've never been to Pennsylvania. 
Yeah, yeah. Do you know the story of why they they moved the T Rex holotype there back in uh, the forties? You know this, of course. Yeah, it was. They did it under the pretense of the very real threat of a German bombing of New York. Yep. Um, I mean, people yeah. were moving all kinds of art and all kinds of other specimens from different museums into underground bunkers or shipping them inland. Um, but I've heard some people talk about how they have a suspicion that the American museum just like wanted some cash and they just used that as sort of, you know, wouldn't be the first time I suppose. Uh, yeah. There are museums that want to get rid of old specimens and like yeah. sometimes if they have a good excuse for it and it helps out another museum, all the more power to them. You know, I'm working with a situation like that right now with some museums yeah. and, uh, Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So what was it like to actually see the holotype of, of T-Rex there? Because that must have been pretty cool. For those of you in chat who are not aware, a holotype is like the original specimen. If you find another creature that you think might be the same critter, you compare it to the holotype. So it's like holotypes almost it's take on almost... Yeah, it, it it almost takes on like sort of a sacred quality, not to be too corny about it, but uh, it's it, it's pretty special. Yeah, w what was that like seeing that? It was even? pretty amazing. I mean, it's it's unbelievable how large T Rex skull bones are. Yeah. It's like it doesn't it's matter nuts. how many times I've seen them. I mean, especially as. I mean, I, I've been studying this, these Tyrannosaurus skulls lately for this project that we just finally just submitted to a journal. Um, but so it's like studying other Tyrannosaurs like Despletosaurus or Lythronax or Teratophonius or Gorgosaurus. It's just, you're like, yeah, these are big animals. And then you see the same bone that you're used to seeing on a 30 foot long Tyrannosaur. And then you yeah. see it on a T Rex. And it's just like, or, or Alexaurus here, yeah. On planet Earth, could this. Yeah, yeah, it's like, it's just hard to believe that something that massive <laughs> once existed. It's nuts. It really is. Like, who this... is the holotype paleontologist? <laughs> tried. That's one of the in the chat there. Yeah, Cope. He uh, he he tried to be the holotype for Homo sapiens. That's a uh, that's a pretty wild story. But he uh, was we... too uh, too ragged. Yeah, yeah, that syphilis and maybe some other ailments as well but yeah you know jim got to actually hold cope's skull and there's that photo of him in that book uh i have that right here actually um yeah pretty uh pretty crazy there's jim right there holding the skull of edward drinker cope uh back in this is probably what 1992 or something like that um yeah, that's a pretty wild story. Uh, we gotta see if we can get Jim talking on camera about that at some point this next summer. Does it look like? Uh, yeah, have you heard anything? Great. Any any scuttlebutt about uh, Doling's Bowl? Are we uh, good to go at the beginning of July? Or heard anything about that, Ethan? I've heard nothing. Ah. I've heard nothing, but I'm pretty sure it'll probably happen. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Cool. Do you do you suspect you our work in Wyoming? Don, or... uh, I haven't yet. No, no. Do you suspect our work in Wyoming and the almond might extend into July this year too, like it did last year? It might be it's too early possible, to say. but I think we're gonna try try not to. Uh, so because of, because of MTE, we had to leave later in the month. Yeah, uh -huh. which kind of forced us to stay a little later into July. Uh huh. But hopefully, just June will be enough. Cool. Okay, I will shoot for that. I might be doing some fieldwork in Idaho in May. I'm talking to L.J. Krumenacker about that. We might have some Arctodromius specimens to dig up. Yeah. Um. But I will definitely nice. be there. I'll be ready beginning of June to go do some fieldwork in the almond. I'm really looking forward to that. It's uh. Yes. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, wait. Ethan. I should I should I let wait. you go. It's been almost an hour longer than I said it was gonna be. But thank you so much for being game for this interview and uh really appreciate your time and your expertise. 
everybody's really looking forward to seeing you again in the field this next summer and we'll probably run a fundraiser in about may see if we can uh earn some more funds go out and dig up these dinosaurs we've got at least two new dinosaur species from the almond probably more um we'll have to see yeah exciting stuff yes um thanks for having me on danny thanks everyone for uh for asking such great questions yeah thank you so much ethan and um i'm sure we'll see you again soon so take care and uh you know how to close this up right you just uh all right see you again see you ethan doot, 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 doot. <laughs> thanks very much Bye bye. <laughs> uh... All right, let's get our music back going again. There we go. <laughs> Sounds like Ethan's trying to figure out how to close that up. And. Oh, it looks like that's on me, actually. There we go. All right. Good stuff. I hope you had fun with that, everybody. I know I did. I cannot wait to go out and do some more field work with Ethan. Really, really exciting stuff. Being on the forefront of... You know, not to be too dramatic about it. Being on the, you know, on the bleeding edge of dinosaur paleontology, digging up new dinosaurs in a formation that's been understudied is going to be really, really cool. And what a privilege to be able to share that with all of you. And what an honor to be able to, to get funding from, from members of this community here, you know? That's really something special. So, yeah. Yeah. S.B. Harkin says, Ethan is a stupendous guest. I'm glad you think so, S.B. Harkin. I'm glad you agree. Uh, good stuff. Linnea says, thanks for having Ethan on. Of course. Easy choice for our first paleontologist guest interviewee. We'll be having more of these, hopefully, something like one per week, if we're lucky. I've got uh, a short list of contacts for next week. Next week that I have to uh, have to ask, but uh, stay tuned for that. That is going to be excellent. And thank you so much, everybody, for your support. It's only because we've got this, you know, Twitch Partner Plus status now that I can afford to actually pay an honorarium to our guests. Before, when we had guests on the stream, I was a little reticent to ask scientists to, to give up some of their precious free time to show up here on stream. As paleontologists, we already tend to be overworked and underpaid. Now that we've reached kind of a you know a different tier financially here on twitch that allows me to actually pay researchers for their time deliver an honorarium like that so thank you to everybody who has uh who has helped that happen i really really appreciate that and with that having been said Let me tell you what we're going to get up to tomorrow. And Peg Pets, thank you for the 21 months. Keep it up, Danny. I will keep it up, Peg Pets, thanks to your support. 21 months right there is impressive, and I really appreciate it. I hope you realize that with the new revenue split, 70% instead of just 50% of your sub there goes to supporting this channel and goes to 
promoting science outreach here on Twitch, so I really appreciate that, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, Slumber. I appreciate that. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be doing one of two things. i got to figure out, what do we have on our schedule tomorrow? So busy that I didn't have a chance to look. Uh, there's nothing on our schedule for tomorrow. So, either we will be talking about... Well, you know what? I know what we're going to be talking about. We'll be talking about fossil whales tomorrow. Because there's a new documentary that just came out... ...about fossil whales. We will be going over this tomorrow. Check this out. This has been all the rage recently. We might even have some colleagues showing up here on the screen. Wadi Hitan in Egypt's Sahara Desert. Yeah. Hidden beneath these rocks are secrets from a time long before humans. Long, long before. Not in Wales, in Egypt, Reagan Nation. Uh. Many people think of Egypt like ancient Egyptian civilization, like Pharaohs, Finks, and Romans even. But what I'm studying is way beyond this time. Way, way before that time. Holy cow. Um, this is a lovely new documentary here, and I think you're really going to like it. In the Sahara Desert. Fossils are everywhere, telling you what life looked like 40 million years ago. An incredible discovery. We have a complete skeleton. May reveal the origins. Of the prehistoric whale that lived here long time ago. Of the world's largest mammals. This is so awesome. They're doing everything mammals do, but in the water. When whales could walk on Nova. Wednesday evening at 8. Or tomorrow at 2 p.m. California time. Um, some of you who are in uh, regions outside of the United States might not have the wherewithal to, uh, to watch this. For those of you who, who do, let me give you the link. There it is in the chat. But yeah, we'll be talking about this tomorrow. We'll do some more Metazoa. We'll do lots of Q&A, all that good stuff. It's going to be a good time. It's going to be a good time. So tune in for that. But for right now... Wow, it's not the dinosaur we knew. Just look at that thing. It's not going to be friendly to us. Namulala. Thank you for the five Thanks months, Thanks to Exospot and Zero for my sub-gift. And thank you for continuing that sub-gift, sub uh, Namulala. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. And without further ado... It's time to wrap up today's stream. I've got to eat some dinner. I've got to go use the little paleontologist room. I've got to get ready for tomorrow's stream as well. There's a lot to do. Thank you, everybody, whose names are about to be enshrined here within our credits. Thank you, thank you for a wonderful stream. I hope you had a good time. I hope you learned something. I hope you're inspired to learn more about the natural world and our place in it. Good stuff. Don't go away just yet. We are going to see who else is here on Twitch at present. And we are going to go raid into them. Astro Canuck is doing some live astronomy. We're going to go raid into Astro Canuck. And we will move from deep time to deep space.
Well, don't go away, everybody. We'll go see what Tom is up to at Astro Canuck. Looking at the heavens live through a telescope here on Twitch. How cool is that? Thank you to everybody. Moderators, raiders, followers, gifters, subscribers, cheerers. Everybody, thank you so much for your ongoing support. It means so much to me, and it's the only reason I can continue to, to do this five days a week. Because so, I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world. We'll do paleontology outreach full time. It really is special. And I am deeply, deeply grateful. So thank you each and every one of you for making this possible. Please know I do not take that for granted. It is something pretty unique. Thank you. Now, let's go pass some love on to Astro Canuck, and I will see you there, everybody. You take care of yourselves. Until tomorrow, bye-bye.